Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the City Council meeting of Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Madam City Clerk, we have the roll call, please. Council Member Chow? Here. Council Member Sinks? Here. Council Member Willie? Here. Vice Mayor Paul? Here. Mayor Scharf? Here. So I want to report out on the closed session. Uh, this was public employee performance evaluation under Government Code Section uh, 54957 for City Attorney. Uh, this was actually going to be continued to a future meeting. Um, so we did not take any action on this tonight. Um, we are on to ceremonial matters and presentations, of which there are none. Madam City Clerk, any postponements? No postponements, Mr. Mayor. Okay, seeing no postponements, it looks like we are on to oral communications. I have a number of cards. Ah, okay, before I do this, I want to say a little about oral communications. Um, you may address the council for up to three minutes on matters not on the agenda. Your comments must be on a topic that's within the city's jurisdiction, and the council cannot discuss or take any action on an issue raised during oral communications. If you wish to speak, please fill out a speaker card, although it's not technically required and you're not required to use your real name or address if you do not want to. So starting off, here is the first one is from a resident. The second one is from Henry Chang. The third is Anjali Kauser. So welcome a resident. Oh, I respect the mayor and the council members. And this is uh, um, regarding the um, uh, police structure and the shed in the back and the lack of the resolution uh, because this is uh, uh, not a neutral person on it. And also, since this happened, and the city codes changed actually twice, and basically target uh, this um, little build up. And the, no other city does that. And this is uh, also retaliation because currently in charge of the person is a police officer, active police officer with a few colleagues. They have a 3.2 million budget and not for the city residents at all, in which no other city does that. And also every time we talk to a, a people like you, the council member and the um, neutral person and the ramifications, five figure penalty and another ones, we want a neutral person here and they were the one actually late that didn't show up they add another half five figure um, ramification as well and team up with their attorneys. So it's for the financial needy family, it's very excruciating, very heartbroken, very terrifying, and very horrible nightmares. So and we believe it's generally found that um, we targeted because we were speaking up for the community in the beginning for the, what's going on in the downtown area and we were specially targeted well when we request that information, and they even um, we got even more retaliation on that. Um, so, so we request the council member to have a um, no cost um, mediation on this matter, and uh, also have the code uh, um, more towards the helping the residents instead of targeting us. And also disclose the information who was single us out because we feel like it's prejudiced because we will try to help in the community. Thank you. And we want this put on agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam City Attorney, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we can, since there's pending litigation, I don't think we can do anything as a council. Is that the case? It, yes, this is a pending matter that I'm updating council and if you'd like to provide direction, um, we can at a closed session. Okay, thank you. Um, so, 
Next we have Henry Chang, followed by Anjali Kauser, followed by, um, Sin I can't read, it looks like Sinat Singhal. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and the City Manager. <clears throat> I would like to thank the support of our neighbors that came to the meeting tonight. We all have a com common interest in keeping small cell sites and cell towers away from residential neighborhoods. Our main complaint is that the FCC and the wireless companies are trying to promote 5G, but they haven't done any scientific studies to see if there are negative health effects. Other countries, like Switzerland, were all excited about putting in 5G antennas, but recently, they decided to put an indefinite moratorium on them. They want more independent research done on 5G before they expose their citizens to potentially harmful radiation. If wireless companies are allowed to install wireless antennas near homes, there are some things people might be able to do to protect themselves from the harmful RF radiation, but they are expensive solutions. You can buy special RF shielding interior paint for your walls and ceilings. It only comes in black because of the carbon and graphite in the paint. And who wants black walls? For your windows, you can either buy special copper mesh fabric material or RF shielding window films that will block out the harmful radiation. But again, it's very expensive. If you did all that, you might be safe while you're inside your house, but you still won't be protected in your yards. Selling our home and moving away is another alternative, but it sounds like wireless companies want to install antennas all over, including rural areas. Having a cell tower or cell site near your home will definitely affect the value of your home. I would hesitate buying a house if there is a cell site near it. Having wireless antenna nearby doesn't mean you'll get better phone reception unless you are a customer of that provider. Wireless antenna should be located in the industrial areas, commercial districts, in the middle of freeways, or perhaps on overpasses, but not in residential neighborhoods or near elementary schools. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have Anjali Kauser, followed by Sanat followed by um, Brandon Pan. Welcome, Anjali. Thank you. Just give me a second. Stop, stop, stop. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Anjali Kauser with the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to come by and share with you what, it, how the Chamber is bringing community and businesses together. We had a, a summer fair a few weeks ago where we had the local businesses here and the community was here to sign up their children for the summer camp. In addition, we were celebrating, we celebrated the diversity in Cupertino through the Lunar New Year luncheon and a number of you were there, thank you. So I thought the best way to show this is to just do a short video for you and so you can experience what we all experienced of to be a successful two events. So here it goes.
Thank you. Hey, thank you. Sorry I missed the luncheon. I was uh, at Association of Bay Area Government meeting. I'm sure I would have much rather have been at the <laughs> lunar luncheon. We missed you too. <laughs> Hopefully at the next event we will be seeing you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anjali. Next we have Sanat, followed by Brandon Pan, followed by Brooke Azat. Welcome, Sanat. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, honorable Mayor and esteemed council members, um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm, I'm here representing the Cupertino Youth Climate Action Team, and we spoke at the last uh, special meeting, but we would like to uh, echo our points again just for the public as well as for you uh, to summarize our points. So I would, I would like to start by thanking the City Council for passing a, a strong REACH code that to position Cupertino as a climate leader, and I would also like to thank Mayor Shar for meeting with the Cupertino Youth Climate Action Team and echoing support for two of our um, policy ideas which are adding green Mondays and single-use plastic waste reduction to the official 2020 Cupertino City Council plan. So I'd just like to speak about three of the items that we spoke about. Firstly, Green Mondays. Um, Green Mondays has two components. Which one is featuring environmentally responsible plant-based meals uh, on Mondays. This could be done through restaurants as well as the city um, promoting this themselves by encouraging staff and um, council members to eat um, plant-based meals on Mondays. Um, <clears throat> as well as educating residents on the impacts of their food choices on climate change and the environment. Meat production creates more greenhouse gas emissions than all of the transportation sector combined in the whole world. And while we're targeting transportation <clears throat> as a city, we are not doing enough to combat um, meat production and the uh, effects of our food choices on the climate. So the second item I'd like to speak about is plastic reduction. Um, <clears throat> so the Cupertino Climate Action Team would like to recommend that we because of the fact that single-use plastics are often not recycled or disposed properly, we need, clim uh, we need a policy to fight single-use plastics, and thus an ordinance that will reduce plastic po uh, pollution by prohibiting the distribution of plastic straws, other food accessories, and providing accessories upon request would be, is necessary. Targets, it would target disposable items such as straws, stirrers, napkins, utensils, uh, condiments, things like that. And businesses should only provide this when necessary or um, when asked or um, uh, upon request. And um, there should be a charge. Um, for example, Berkeley's charge was $0.25 for disposable cups. And the last item is climate restoration and carbon negative building materials. So these are technologies that are available today to remove the excess of trillion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And the city <coughs> should direct staff to return to the city council for an, uh, for an analysis of low embodied emissions in concrete <coughs> and carbon negative building materi materials. Uh, and this would be very beneficial by significantly reducing CO2, which is better for um, everyone. And places that actually use carbon negative cement have uh, have seen this uh, have seen this benefit already. So those are the three items I, I would like to speak to and now I would like to give my rest of my time to Brandon. Thank you. Okay, welcome Brandon. Hi council members, my name is Brandon Pan. I'm a Cupertino High School student. Um, I'm also here to recap three of the Youth Climate Action Team's points from last Tuesday. Uh, more specifically, water conservation through the use of native plant gardens and recycled water, public education workshops, and summer sustainability internships. So on the topic of water conservation, the city has already taken many great initiatives towards improving the efficiency of water usage, but there's always more that we can do in order to make sure citizens are fully utilizing the advantages of these policies. So the council, you guys recognize the benefits of environmentally friendly po property alterations like native plant gardens and laundry to landscape gray water recycling systems, but we haven't seen like massive amounts of residents take full advantage of the opportunities available. So the solution is public awareness and education. If residents are aware of the benefits that these green policies bring, then they're much more likely to utilize them. Public workshops focusing on eco-friendly actions, whether that's the conversion to native plant gardens or money-saving ideas on electrification, uh, will go far in reducing the city's pollutions. As previously mentioned, we've received a grant um, from Silicon Valley Clean Energy in order to help spread awareness, and we're more than willing to collaborate with the city on this issue. Then one of the key aspects of ensuring a lasting change that spans multiple generations is to engage the youth. 
So aside from workshops and school presentations, the city can offer summer internships to students who wish to gain more experience in the field of environmental policy. So the students would also be able to uh, help assist the city's implementation of new policies. I understand that this is already something in the works and um, the Youth Climate Action Team provides full support for this and we'd be willing to work with the city in order to promote and tailor these internships to our youth. Uh, thank you guys for your strong stance on the environment and I hope we continue to see that trend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have um, Brooke Gazat followed by Nori. Welcome, Brooke. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. We have a resident who frequently comes here um, and is obviously in a great deal of pain. Um, and I was wondering if we could have her uh, situation agendized so that it can be addressed. Um, she doesn't seem to understand that her issue needs to be placed on the agenda in order to be dealt with. And she also doesn't, I don't think she um, has enough knowledge to know that the council or the sheriff's department cannot expunge her record and she needs to go through the court system and I was wondering if something could be done to help her. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know how much we can disclose about the situation. Madam City Attorney and our, um, I, I think our city manager has something to, uh, to read about that. Uh, I'm not sure which matter is this. Um, I think we are aware. Okay. Oh. I'm pretty sure of the matter. Okay. Um, so can it yeah, be even she, with she, No. Um, the city council and the city manager, we do not independently investigate these types of issues or allegations. The allegations are of um, illegal behavior by sheriff deputies and captains. And um, I guess I'll read the whole statement, um, although she's not here. So I want to let Ms. Lee and the public know that the city has been receiving and addressing her complaints. As you know, the city contacts the sheriff's office for police services in Cupertino. Between March of 2017 and April of 2018, the Internal Affairs Division of the Sheriff's Office has received seven inquiries and complaints from Ms. Lee. The Internal Affairs Division investigates allegations of illegal behavior by sheriff deputies and captains. All complaints alleging false statements or false arrests were reviewed by the Internal Affairs Division and the matters were closed without any finding of wrongdoing. Captain Urena has also spoken to Ms. Lee in June of 2017 and most recently in January of 2020. On both occasions, he advised that she should direct her complaints to the public defender handling her case as a defense to her arrests and to the Sheriff's Office, the Internal Affairs Division. I would second that advice. Um, the city council and the city manager do not independently investigate these types of allegations. That is the role of the public defender and the internal affairs division of the sheriff's office. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next, we last card I have is Nori. Welcome, Nori. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about cell towers. Based on GIS map for the cell tower location, four active small cells, 15 permitted small cells, which means already built but not active, 14 proposal, proposed small cells, and 39 macro cell towers. There are 19 cell towers were already built and 14 more are proposed by Verizon and AT&T. And also T-Mobile in spring will build their own cell towers so that the number can be doubled. In addition, 5G deployment is coming. 5G is shorter wavelength, which means 5G will bring faster broadband speed than 4G. But it also means much shorter range Therefore, 5G re will require an enormous expansion of current cell tower infrastructure in order to function. There will be cell facilities on almost all the light poles. Legislation, HR 530, accel accelerating broadband development by empowering local communities act 
of 2019, introduced by U.S. House of Representatives Anna Esho, and the similar bill, S-2012, restoring local control over public infrastructure act of 2019, introduced by U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein. This bill would overturn the new FCC rule and restore local control concerning a replacement of 5G equipment on phone and utility poles. Until those bills are passed, we still need the city ordinance to regulate the location of the widest communication facilities, including macro cell towers, and establish minimum distance. And or this restriction should be added in the document guideline for small cell on city on poor encroachment requirement, which was created city engineer last April. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam City um, Attorney, what is our ability to do anything that violates the current FCC rules prior to perhaps Senator Feinstein's bill going right. forward? Well, we cannot violate current rules. <laughs> um, there, okay. We had a study session on small cells last year that was fairly comprehensive, and I'd invite any member of the public to to watch that um, study session if they'd like, and um, any other further action could be uh, considered on the city work program going forward. Okay, and um, perhaps our legislative committee can also, um, on our next meeting, weigh in on this, uh, decide if we want to um, contact the senator, uh, the two senators, about this issue, because I did see the other gentleman who spoke um, about Switzerland, and it is true what he stated, um, but that's all we can discuss here now. Okay, um, so we are done with oral communications. We are on, what? Oh, okay, welcome, come speak. And then you can fill out a card afterwards if, if you don't mind, but it's not required. Uh, hi, I'm a resident of Rancho Rinconada, um, and I'm here to voice my concerns over the Rancho Pool continuing as a special district. Current board members have proven they are extremely difficult to work with. Three hey, board excuse members. Excuse me, is this not on our agenda for t this evening? We do have an item on the agenda, and the time to speak on that would be. That oh, evening. right. Sorry. So. Could, would you mind speaking when that item comes up on the agenda? Oh, I don't this know. This is for items not on the agenda. Oh, sorry. Okay, no, it's fine. So that'll be more appropriate because you'll hear right. the staff report. Because then we'll be able to discuss it with it's you as well. It's item number... Uh, um, Which item? Oh, well, whatever. 19. Wow. 19, but we have a bunch of consent items. That right, should go yeah, it should, go, it should go pretty quickly. Um, so we are on to reports by council and staff, and this is only about our committee assignments. So, Rob, would you like to start? Um, sure. Uh, Silicon Valley uh, Clean Energy met, and we um, are uh, considering what allocations to take from uh, PG&E uh, because Basically, the state is saying uh, we've put a big enough dent in demand for their electricity that we are all going to be allocated some. We can choose to take it or sell it for whatever we can get for it. So there's a, a fair amount of uh, discussion about how we uh, do that. Um, the fees that the, that the PUC is proposing to charge us uh, our customers, but effectively we absorb into our rates um, to pay for PG&E's um, over-market uh, assets may go up uh, by 100% um, uh, sometime this summer, depending on how the PUC rules. That ruling is expected in the next few weeks. Our intention 
uh, is to continue to be to provide electricity to residents and businesses in the 12 cities uh, that we operate in, plus the unincorporated county, uh, to charge less than PG&E across the board uh, with electricity that is um, carbon free. So um, uh, some of these allocations may make us a little less than carbon free and we're working through, uh, yeah, some, uh, some discussions about how we migrate our mission given the uh, the threats from both the PUC and, and uh, perhaps the, the legislature. But I would say we are uh, uh, continue to be on sound footing and uh, are ramping up our programs this year. Thank you. Oh, Rod, do you want to report on the Cities Association meeting? Well, I wasn't sure because you... Yeah, why don't you do it since you um, I let Rod, um, even though he's the alternate, the alternate. he... Uh, he was the attendee at the last sure. meeting. Sure. So um, we uh, looked through a, a set of principles back in August that Transform and a coalition called Voices for Public Transit um, had uh, developed. Uh, in November, we had uh, a discussion, ratified uh, those as principles that we thought the Cities Association could support. Um, uh, further, we, uh, at this meeting, uh, considered a pr proposal more specific, that is something called REX, R-E-X. So if you, anybody who's interested can Google transform REX, R-E-X, and see what sort of a, um, a network diagram uh, they've put together. This has gone in from them as a nonprofit to MTC and has received good scoring, better scoring, in fact, than almost everything that VTA, as an official transit agency here, had proposed, including BART to San Jose. So the Cities Association was supportive, not of the specific network, but of the principles. Um, and so over the next um, few months, um, MTC will consider which projects to, to green light, um, presuming there's some kind of uh, funding measure in the next several years. This is sort of like we do with master plans. And, and then, uh, yeah, looking for, look for funding opportunities. So the plan will get readjusted as to, to make sure that high performance routes um, are, are covered. And uh, the Cities Association voted to provide a letter of support for the concept to uh, MTC. So that letter went out today. And I'd be happy to send it through the city manager to the whole council. Um, what else do you think noteworthy? So Was there any legislation that you agreed to support? I can't, I can't recall. We, I think we're still muddling on all the housing things. Right, the replacement we, we for agreed on, 50. Uh, We agreed to continue our discussion about housing principles, but basically we had a strong statement last year, and uh, the chair of the committee is taking input on that prior to consideration next month, uh, and on uh, continuing yeah, discussions on transportation principles. So those two, housing and transportation, remain of the highest priority for the Cities Association. Um, a third one is resilience, uh, in the, particularly in the face of PSPS events, the, the power uh, utility shutoff events, among other things, are of high concern to uh, Cities Association members. Some are interested in, in public safety, increasing crime rates, and that sort of thing. So any discussion about the, I heard, upcoming $1 billion tax ma sales tax measure? Well, the sales tax measure called FASTER is a proposed to be a $100 billion measure, a 1% sales tax over the next 40 years. And um, I mean, incidentally, you may note that I worked on an editorial that went into the Mercury News and the East Bay Times um, uh, expressing my personal opinion about this. But uh, both MTC and ABAG are working on trying to figure out what they want to sponsor 
um, for no the November 2020 ballot. And the debate generally is focused around a bond measure for um, housing funded by property taxes, uh, a sales tax measure um, that just described called FASTER that would be, um, uh, would support uh, transportation. Um, and then there, there's been a, a lot of discussion about uh, how these things are polling and whether one or both uh, can pass it. The belief um, is you can't put two measures on and have both of them I'm pass. just curious uh, whether cities association would take a position or would be discussing this in the future? I am sure uh, cities association will. And frankly, the last time on RM3, the, the opinion of leaders was quite divided, right? We had some that were supportive of RM3 and some of us who weren't. But these things are always... Um, Contentious. Contentious, uh, um, particularly as regards the source of the funding, I think, but also the composition, what the projects go to. So, and, and they're both very material toward people forming positions. And, I, you know, this council may want to weigh in on this. Uh, yeah, I'm sure too, we as will. the debate goes forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I have a request yeah. with regard to our Cities Association representation. So um, I, I think uh, Councilmember Sinks has done a, a very capable job representing our city on the Cities Association over the last several years. Uh, when I ran in 2009, actually, 11 years ago, um, unsuccessfully for Council, I did point out that uh, Cupertino didn't have a Bay Area Air Quality Management District position. And uh, I recently learned, uh, speaking with Councilmember Sinks in one of these breaks, that uh, his position on the board of BACMED was actually derived from the Cities Association. And given the fact that Councilmember Sinks is terming out this year, uh, I think it would be really good to have an eye on how, if not Cupertino, can retain uh, that particular seat. Uh, one of our neighboring interested jurisdictions could do so. So I, I would love to see some um, discussion and perhaps some um, oriented um, right. maneuvering, if you will. So that's uh, the selection that committee. Particular. That's the selection committee yeah. Yeah. that selects for all yeah, the different exactly. boards. Yeah, so, exactly. So they're actually, in the Cities Association, there's the, the ledge committee that typically meets first uh, on, a t on a Thursday night. Following that, the City Selection Committee. And that's the committee that appointed me to the Air District twice, I guess. It also does other regional appointments, right? So uh, the Airplane Commission, something or other, there's something from the city, but, you know, and then uh, uh, MTC, we have a seat that we appoint, currently filled by Jeannie Bruins from Los Altos. Uh, I think those are the two, perhaps, biggest regional ones, but right. then a bunch of small ones having to do with, you know, if it's not uh, done on a per city basis, typically right. the appointment is done at the city's association. And I'm always open to taking any feedback you have on sure. is this um, done on that a, come up, but yeah. uh, is Stephen, it done, I think, is the person this year. So. Is it done on an annual basis or is it every couple it's of It's when years? the positions need to be up. filled. Yeah. Okay. Okay, got yeah. it. Got All right. Right. And, right. and I think what's supposed to happen, what you should all get from our executive director is notice pr well prior to the meeting. If you're interested in serving, right. please submit. And typically it's just a letter of interest with anything you want to say. And then if it's competitive, you have to call around. Right. Yeah, I've seen the My ones that are competitive. Um, yeah. And it the lobbying me, that takes place. It took place. me three or four times to get the air district seat. I think there's some where they have to beg people to take it. There's that too, <laughs> yes. Okay, so council member. Sorry Chow. about the long-winded report, but it seemed of interest. So. so I have the economic development committee meeting that was canceled and environmental review committee that was canceled too. Yeah, I'm gonna let you do the honors on audit, okay? Yeah. Wow, so, uh, okay, my big event was on Friday the 7th. I went to San Francisco for the Association of Bay Area Government meeting. Uh, before the official business meeting, there was a panel on housing. Um, the three legislators were our state senator, Jim Bell, San Francisco assembly person, David Chu, and state senator, Scott Weiner. And so a lot of it was about SB 50 and the failure of SB 50 this year. And, um, the attempts to try again with something similar. And 
It did not take long in that panel before Cupertino was brought up, um, unfairly, I believe, and they did, ha they did have the opportunity for the audience members to ask questions, and I was waving my hand frantically, and they would not recognize me until uh, the a council member from Pleasanton, Pleasanton yelled out, we think the mayor of Cupertino should be able to speak to defend his city. So I did speak. Um, again, it was the misstatement about um, Cupertino. The, the big misstatement, and we see this often, is about the piece of land where the Apple Campus 2 spaceship is. Um, the rhetoric continues to be um, essentially, that was an empty piece of land. Cupertino added 13,000 jobs and didn't add any housing, none of which is actually true, which I pointed out, and I continue to point out regarding um, what was there before the HP campus with 9,800 employees, the fact that all 13,000 employees at the Apple spaceship were not new employees. Most of them were transfers from other Apple facilities. Um, so I think... I did get applause when I finished, so I think people did appreciate hearing the facts on that, and I will repeat them till I'm blue in the face. And then the business meeting was not that interesting. It was just accepting some funding from the state, which of course they did accept. Following the business meeting, there was a discussion of RENA, Regional Housing Needs Allocation, a long presentation on how the new numbers uh, will be allocated, a warning that the numbers are going to be huge. Uh, we're hoping that they look at each city's jobs housing balance and assign more numbers to the cities with poor jobs housing balances, of which we are not one. Um, they're also looking at school. Originally, they were going to look at the quality of schools and now they said they're gonna look at school funding. Uh, speaking of who just walked in the room. <laughs> so they're looking at school funding. Um, so for better or worse, our at least CUSD is one of the most poorly funded districts in the state, so that, that could help us a little uh, on, our, on our arena number. Uh, we shall see. Uh, and that, that's it, that's all I have, thank you. Darcy. Uh, yes, thanks. On February 11th, uh, we had the audit committee meeting, and uh, this year, uh, Councilmember Sinks is on the audit committee. Uh, Mayor Scharf has uh, has has, has uh, relinquished his uh, seat there, um, and we are uh, going really well in the city's finances. We received an update with respect to our various investment positions um, from the entities that are managing our portfolios. Uh, as you can imagine, with the performance of uh, the markets this year, it's been a, a fairly uh, robust and, and positive economic, um, you know, statement. Uh, we also looked at a draft of our comprehensive uh, annual financial report, or CAFR, uh, in the acronym. It, uh, I think, is, is also in very good shape. Uh, I've been on the audit committee multiple years in uh, my terms here, and uh, I would say that in in... Uh, with respect to the timing of our um, making sure that these reports are released on a timely basis, uh, we are doing as well as I've seen. Um, and then finally, um, we uh, visited a somewhat uh, unfortunate uh, episode in our uh, city's finances on an ongoing basis, which uh, is an ongoing criminal case of embezzlement of our um, one of our former accountants in the city. Um, so this uh, allegedly took place between 2000 and 2014, and um, as a result, uh, a lot of positive things occurred with regard to our, our city and our finances. Um, one of the things that the audit committee is now considering is the initiation of an external auditor process for Cupertino. And uh, given the fact that we do come from smaller town roots, but are now um, you know, very firmly entrenched in a lot of uh, quite significant uh, transactions and um, and operations as well as projects. Uh, it, it does make sense uh, on many levels to uh, hire an external auditor. So we were introduced to um, 
a representative of the auditor that our finance department as well as the city manager's office has chosen. And uh, I very much look forward to the results of these auditing efforts in the years to come. I think it's not just a matter of making sure that we have financial integrity, but also a matter of making sure that we are optimizing our systemic, uh, systemic city performances uh, across the board. So it should be quite positive. Uh, one of the things that the auditor was very um, diligent and assiduous about pointing out is that, look, this is a collaborative process. This is not a game of gotcha. We're not trying to point the finger at anyone. We're just trying to uh, really improve our city's processes. So it was a good meeting. Thanks. Hey, John. So <clears throat> the only meeting I needed to attend was uh, being the alternate on Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and Councilman Sinks has already reported out on that. So. Okay, very good. So we are on to consent calendar. And I will pull item 13. Um, let's see. I also have a card pulling item 14. So can I have a uh, motion for the rest of consent? I'd like to move consent items 2 through 12. Second. Okay. Vote. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. So we are on to... Item 13, this is the approval of the Library Commission's recommendation of Jingjing Yang for the appointment of the new Cupertino Poet Laureate. And I do have a um, proclama proclamation here. Um, maybe before we vote on this, we could, um, uh, is uh, Jingjing Yang here? Welcome, come up, come up on the stage. We also have the, the <coughs> Libra poet. Library Commission Selection okay. Committee who would like to also come up. Great, and of course. So you'd like to speak first? Um, sure. Yes, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Ann Muto. I was a past Port Laureate, and um, I was the co-chair of the Selection Committee. Carol Lindley was the other co-chair, and um, we had uh, five other members, Debbie Banny, Diana Argerbright, Amanda Wu, and Christine Wang were the Library Commission representatives. Neither one was able to be here tonight. And then uh, finally, Casey McCormick was, uh, is a current Poet Laureate and will be turning over the crown to Jing Jing. So I'd like Casey to introduce Jing Jing to you. Great, thank you. Welcome, Casey. Thank you, good evening. I'm so excited to be here. I've had a wonderful two plus years serving as Cupertino Poet Laureate with hundreds of people coming to events. Um, and actually I met the uh, uh, Jing Jing at a Poet Laureate event with Ann Mudo uh, several years ago. Uh, Jing Jing has lived, lived in Cupertino, uh, moved here from China and moved to Cupertino in 2011. Ha her daughter graduated from Monta Vista and she has been an active participant in the Poet Laureate program. In fact, um, Although poetry has been a part of her life since she was a young child, she talks about maturing in, as a poet through the Cupertino Poet Laureate Program. And so it was with great honor that I introduce you to Jing Jing Yang. Great, welcome Jing Jing. Good evening, um, Mayor and Vice Mayor and all the council members. Um, thank you, this, this is a great honor and uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, using, I'm using um, Maria Angelou's word. She said, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive. To do so with some passion, some compassion, and some humor, and some style. So I would like, I would like to use the poetry as the voice of style, or this, or the I'm using the poetry as a voice to celebrate creativity in the city of Cupertino, and uh, thanks to two previous um, poet laureate, um, they watched me grow from a timid poet want to be and actually become a poet, and I won the first place um, in 2017 in uh, celebrating creativity poetry contest. So right now I'm just 
can't wait to get everything started. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And we have a proclamation if the city council will join me along with um, the new poet laureate. Okay, normally I don't read the proclamations, but I've been asked to do that tonight. So let's go. Whereas Jingjing Yang is embarking into this new role where highlighting poetry will be her goal. And when Jingjing entered a Cupertino competition, her poetry landed her in the first place position. And Jingjing has produced poetry for several years some fill you with joy, others leave you in tears. And Jingjing will give us hours of her personal time to ensure we have plenty of haikus and rhyme. And Jingjing knows ballads, hymns, limericks, and odes. She can lead our community down many new roads. And Jingjing is now Cupertino's official poet, and with the honor of my office, I hereby bestow it. I, Mayor Stephen M. Scharf, and the Cupertino City Council do hereby recognize Jingjing Yang for outstanding public service as Poet Laureate. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Cupertino to be affixed this Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. Signed, Stephen M. Scharf, the Mayor. Thank you. So did, did you write that poem? Uh, this one? Uh, yes. Oh, here. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and uh, City Councils and everyone. Thank you to Anne and Casey. And I'm just um, excited. I, it's an extraordinary honor and uh, I will do my best and uh, make the community full of creativities and arts. Um, thank you, thank you. And, uh, okay, thanks. So thank you, we're looking forward to two years of good poetry. Okay. Thank we'll you. <laughs> yes. Oh, of course. Yeah, we um, Casey, if you'd like to come up, so we can thank you for your years of two years of service. Yes, of course, and you can recite a poem too. Do you have one? I don't have one memorized. No. Oh, I, I could do one, but it wouldn't wouldn't rhyme. <laughs> oh, roses are red, violets are blue. Most poems rhyme. Too bad this one doesn't. <laughs> Thank you. I will say, I forgot to mention that we're having a big celebration on the 27th over at the Quinlan Center, uh, where our, uh, as part of my term, we're launching an anthology of voices collected throughout the community. So if you're available on the 27th at 7 o'clock, it's open to the community. So thank you. And we may have to establish Cupertino rap in this new term, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. So if I recall correctly, when you were inaugurated as the Poet Laureate, were you wearing a cast? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, be very careful because this is a, da a very da dangerous assignment. I will remind you because in 2018, Vice Mayor Nashville. Okay. read poems in our event. Oh, wow. Really? Great. In, in English? Yes. Okay. Okay. So next time is you. Okay. Leander, you. Um, someone did, where is our photographer? Oh, I guess we don't have our photographer here today, do we? Okay. Okay, Randy, thank you. To me, it's just amazing. Her first English, her, 
Her first language is not English, and she just came to U.S. so recently. And then to achieve such, it's a quite a, an accomplishment to okay. master not only the language but poet. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Madam City Manager, I don't believe we are paying for this, right? We're reimbursed. If you're talking about the contract. The $7 million. We're, we're getting reimbursed. Right. But to answer the member of the public's uh, question about the sweeping, it's as part of another permit, so that is not considered in these sets of contracts. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I think sweeping is important. I know when the Apple campus was being constructed, uh, there was a lot of dirt on Tantau, and uh, I know cyclists were getting into accidents because uh, the sweeping uh, was a concern. So the city currently already have standards on how, what kind of sweeping is required for construction projects like this, right? Where could a resident find out this standard or regulations that developers are required to follow so they have a peace of mind? We haven't had a chance to formally review the plans yet, um, but we, certainly we will have a um, discussion. I mean, well, sweeping well, standards. City engineer, actually city engineer sweeping standards it. should be general, right? That applies to every project. Um, okay, so the city engineer can yeah. answer. Good evening, uh, council members. Um, Chad Mosley, city engineer. Uh, Bay Area, uh, the Bay Area has BMPs in place that are standard erosion control measures for all construction projects. Um, they don't dictate the number of passes a sweeping truck has to be out there. They just ensure that the streets need to be kept free and clear of dirt and debris. Um, with the Apple Campus project, there was an immense amount of dirt and debris being moved around, so we had them sweeping all the time. And with the, uh, the Valco project, I imagine we'll have something very much the same. Um, every complaint that came in regarding dirt and mud, we uh, had our, on, our inspector on site go out and investigate that, verify if something needed to happen immediately, and what further we could do to address those situations. Um, so you mean we rely on a regional standard? We don't have our city standards on this issue. So this is complaint-based. So the, 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 the regional standard is to ensure that dirt and debris does not enter the storm drain system. Mm -hmm. And that's the city standard as well. And so we are just initiating uh, those standards to keep dirt and debris off of the roads. That includes mud and dirt that's tracked onto the roads from equipment. And this is why we have a uh, How about air quality? And can Dust I just emphasize air. that right now the item oh. is about approving the plan check and inspection right. contracts? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not yeah, debating the, okay. the so sweeping I'll, the streets right now, so we just need to move this item. I, I understand. I, I will comment that uh, in recent years the Air District passed a rule specifically for this purpose, so particulate matter includes dust from roadways, and we have something called a track out. Uh, standard, um, it's Regulation 6-6-031. Um, track out from a site means the dust that could come from a construction site, and you can't have more than a quart of track out to remain after uh, sweeping. And I think there's one designated in midday and one designated at the end of the day. So it's a pretty stringent standard, and the whole issue is if other traffic then rolls over the dust that's been pulled out by a truck, um, that gets up in the air and that really is a health hazard. So I think that we have one of the most protective standards in, in the Bay Area. And uh, Air District personnel will come and enforce and work with city code enforcement uh, uh, in, in that case. Thank you. Okay. So can we move this item now? It's not. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so when we had this on February 4th, one of our questions was uh, the uniformity of the description of the project between uh, the various contractors. So uh, I'll just make a note for the record that it's uh, probably a total of closer to 22 million distributed over three different contracts. And so uh, I wanna thank the staff for going back um, and presumably to the applicant and making these descriptions uniform. I did notice that, uh, however, in these exhibits A, that they aren't quite as detailed as some of the prior descriptions were. Uh, if we were asked by a member of the public, is there a, a more detailed description of the project that we can reference that would be uniform throughout these contracts, where would it be? Yes, the plan will be public record and anybody can come to the counter and, and view the plans. Okay. Very good. So you used that in the past tense when you said the plan will be public record. Is the plan, in fact, 
uh, publicly available record as of this. Sorry, plan. the approved plans will be made available public record. Okay. And prospectively, when would that be? The approved plan. I, I, I was under the impression that there was some kind of uh, existing yeah, plan. Just to clarify, there's the, the, the project plans that were approved by um, council or by the through the SB 35 project are posted on the city's webpage. There's a SB 35, a Valco SB 35 project webpage that includes the approval level letter, all of the conditions of approval, and the detailed plans that were um, approved for the SB 35 project. Okay. And is there any referencing within these contracts to that set of materials? Yes. The, the project description references the approved. Um, the approved uh, plans. Uh, where in the, so I'm looking at one of the exhibit A's where so the project A. description is available. It's, it's just a paragraph that um, seems to be pretty consistent between the various uh, contracts. Uh, very briefly, the Valco Town Center SB 35 project is located on the 50.82 acre Valco mall, mall property in the city of Cupertino, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm not reading. It's just below that. Okay, scope of inse inspection services. Hang on, I'm, I'm The plans approved it. by the city of Cupertino for the development of the Valco SB 35 project include residential, commercial, and office uses yes. spread among multiple buildings. Okay, and so presumably from that language, uh, a member of the public can look and go, I want to take a look at the plans that were approved by the city of Cupertino as referenced in these contracts. Right. And they would be able to obtain those plans, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, very good. Uh, with that, um, Mayor Scharf, I'd like to move this item. Great. Um, I'll second. Vote. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Now we are on to second reading of ordinances. Uh, item 15. This is a second reading of municipal code amendments to the Cupertino Municipal Code repealing and replacing municipal code chapter 5.5 of Title V, Business Licenses and Regulations, adopting new policy, policies to regulate the sale of tobacco, such as prohibiting the sale or distribution of electronic cigarette products, extending the look-back period for permit suspension from 24 months to 60 months, requiring a minimum age for individuals selling tobacco products, and amending the administrative appeal process for permit violations. Uh, do we have any cards on this? No, Mr. Mayor. No. Um, so is there any discussion on this? We This is the second reading. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Let's see, do we have the clerk then do a sec the second reading? Right, yeah, the clerk can conduct right. the second reading. I'd be happy to move it thereafter. Okay. Microphone. This is the second reading of ordinance number 20-2197, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cupertino repealing and replacing Chapter 5.50 of Title V, Business Licenses and Regulations to regulate the sale of tobacco products. I will move that ordinance number 20-2197 be read by title only and that the City Clerk's reading constitute the second reading thereof. Great. I'll second. Vote. The motion carries unanimously. And I move that ordinance number 20-2197 be enacted. Okay, second. Vote. The motion carries unanimously. Great. Now we're on to item 16, the second reading municipal code amendment to the Cupertino Municipal Code, section 2.20010 to remove the city clerk's duty to attend each closed session of the city council and keep and keep closed session minutes. Uh, so there's no discussion. Oh wait, we have discussion. Yeah. So, sorry. I have second thought about this item. First of all, we are, um, the item on today's agenda would remove the entire section from municipal code which require minutes of closed session to be recorded. 
So as a result, there is no requirement at all to record minutes to the closed session. Um, and uh, I also have second thought on whether it should be the city manager's uh, duty. I think it makes sense to have the city clerk record minutes um, on most of the closed sessions, since it's her duty and she has expertise in doing this job uh, in a way that's neutral. Um, so I'm wondering, should we separate? That's first of first. First of all, I would like the municipal code to still state that we require minutes of closed session recorded in by our city staff, and I understand that the staff recommendation to move this to a resolution was to allow more flexibility. However, I also understand um, there is currently no way for a member of the public to even find out what resolutions are have been um, enacted, adopted on top of a municipal code. For example, even if, if we adopt this five years down the line, it's very hard to find out what the resolutions are related to this municipal municipal code, code section that we have removed. So I think we need to rethink, rethink how we do this. Okay, does anyone else want to comment? So I did have a question. Oh, go ahead. So my comment would be that I also question it in the sense that it, for closed sessions where the city manager is a participant as opposed to um, you know, somebody who's just in attendance, to be a participant and be the one keeping the minutes when the discussion is going back and forth between six or more people, if I was the one trying to keep minutes and I'm a part, an active participant, I know I could very easily um, write the wrong uh, consensus point. Not that we wouldn't check it at the end, but I do see that I think it is more appropriate for a uh, an attendee to be keeping the minutes, and he can he or she can uh, record this this concept, this concept, that concept, and then try and determine which one of those was the final agreement. Now it may be that uh, on meetings when the city manager is not an active participant, maybe she would be able to uh, relieve the uh, city clerk of needing to do that function. But again, for important ones where the city manager is an active participant, I would think a impartial um, uh, person would be better at keeping the minutes, so. I'm persuaded by council members uh, Chow and Willie's uh, rationale. I, I think that uh, reading over the language of the ordinance as it is originally uh, written um, under sections 1, 2.20.010, B and C, uh, it provides the council a good amount of flexibility with respect to designating uh, the city manager or, or frankly anyone else uh, that's within the city employment uh, book of keeping these records. Um, however, I think it's a good idea to, you know, uh, have a record, a, a quote record of topics discussed and decisions made at all closed sessions. And I'm persuaded by the um, reasons brought forth by, by Council Ch Member Chow as well as Council Member Willie. I'm not sure where that would leave us uh, with respect to the resolution that was passed. Um, I would be uh, willing to look at uh, rescinding that resolution, even though it's only been um, in effect for a couple of weeks. Um, but a, before we go forward with enacting this legislation, which would uh, remove a very important mechanism of record keeping uh, from our city, I think it is a good idea to uh, pause and take a look at what the uh, ordinance itself does uh, recommend. And it does say that the person that is imparted with the duty of maintaining our records for the city is also imported with the duty of not keeping minutes, but keeping, quote, uh, a, a minute book 
of, quote, topics discussed and decisions made at all closed sessions. Uh, and Part C indicates that that minute book is not a public record subject to inspection. Uh, and uh, I think that it is a, it is, it is a wise uh, piece of legislation that um, makes sense to um, give a little pause to at this point. So I, I'm in agreement. I would not support the second reading of this uh, so ordinance. So I mean, what was the impetus of doing this in the first place? Sure. Let me let me clarify just something to make sure. So um, the the municipal code currently establishes that. Well, to begin with, the government code allows cities to have a formal minute book of of what's discussed and actions taken. Absence of a formal minute book, usually notes are kept by the city attorney. Um, this the municipal code designates the city um, clerk to attend every closed session and keep that minute book. Um, the action you took at the last meeting was to remove the city clerk as the person to keep the minutes. There was a feeling um, from staff that, that um, the city manager would be more appropriate, it would be more efficient since the city manager is already in the meetings. The city clerk um, hasn't been attending city council closed session meetings for, for many, many years now. Um, but it is up to council to decide who they wish to designate. Um, we. Uh, the ordinance is removing that portion from the municipal code, which is listed under city clerk duties, is where that lives. It says one of the city clerk duties is to take minutes and attend every closed session. And pursuant to the government code, which says that you can adopt a policy to have a formal minute book, either by resolution or ordinance, um, what the council approved at the last meeting was a resolution saying, we want a formal minute book, and we're designating the city manager to, to keep those minutes. Um, so you do have a law in place that's as enforceable as any municipal code law that says that a minute book will be kept. Um, so at this point, if you uh, wish to, we could, there's several you know, actions you could take if you wish to change what's in that effective um, resolution right now. Uh, and I can discuss those if you'd like. Well, okay, I mean, I'm fine with the uh city manager keeping the minutes personally. Mm -hmm. um, I don't Could see I a conflict. Could I clarify something? You said the government code re uh, allows minutes to be kept for closed session, mm -hmm. but it's not required, right? And but so you later said that because it's required by the government code, we don't need to have that in our municipal code. So uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, sorry, um, so, so it's not required to keep a minute book. The city can choose so. The resolution that the council passed at the last minute makes it a requirement for the city and says mm. that um, it, it will be minute book required to be kept and they're designating the city manager to keep, to keep, to take the minutes. Um, mm. Council can decide that they don't want that in a resolution, they'd rather have it added to the municipal code and we could do that. I would suggest that we in, um, still amend the municipal code if, if someone else is going to be keeping the minutes because right now that's in the section about the city clerk's duties but if you want mm -hmm. it to be the city clerk we could not do the second reading and instead come back to rescind the resolution you approved so, so that the municipal code would stay the way it is now. So the government code doesn't require it but allows it. That's right. And uh, this, in fact the practice the, it's, it has been in our municipal code that it's required for the city clerk to take minutes in the closed session. That's correct. But for some reason, we haven't been um, doing that. It hasn't been the practice. That's correct. And now, so w the resolution last time didn't really change that practice. It simply moved that practice to the resolution instead of in the municipal code, bec simply because the the the, chim the movement of the duty is not under city clerk anymore. That's correct. But then, my concern is as a result of that, in our municipal code, then there is no requirement to keep closed session minutes. Right. It's in the resolution and not the code. That's correct. Mm. Yeah, the problem with resolution is with, when it's in the municipal code, I can, there is a place that I can look up every section, every chapter of a municipal code. You could add it to the code if you like. But when it's a resolution, there doesn't seem to be a mechanism to even look it up. It might be forgotten later. <laughs> 
So. Well, I, I think we're not, we're not also, we're, we're not talking about the benefit of having the person who is uh, entrusted with recording the city's uh, activities and meetings uh, to be responsible for keeping these records. And I think that's what's originally in the municipal code. I haven't really heard um, a very detailed rationale as to why we're rising to the level of uh, repealing a, an existing municipal ordinance as opposed to modifying it to indicate somebody else. I've, I've heard some kind of indication that perhaps it might be preferable for the city manager as opposed to city clerk as um, you know, grounded in availability. But I mean, from my own perspective on a policy level, that is, uh, that is outweighed by the fact that we have a professional staff member that is supposed to be recording you know, um, cities, cities actions. And um, there's also, there's also some benefit of neutrality in some jurisdictions such as Santa Clara, there is a separately elected city clerk. And um, part of the policy underlying that idea is to make sure that there's someone who is effectively neutral. I know I'm reiterating council member Willie's concerns, but I think it bears repeating that uh, in some of these situations, it would be good to have a neutral member of our staff uh, in the position of recording uh, what decisions are effectuated by council in closed session. And since we do have someone who is articulated as such and identified as such in the municipal code already, um, again, I would support keeping the code as it exists right now. And uh, I would ask that the city uh, bring back an item in a future agenda to, uh, to repeal what we uh, set forth as a resolution last time. So I, I, would, I would just not support uh, changing the municipal code at this point. I haven't heard a convincing reason why we have not been following uh, the municipal code with regard to recording uh, closed session items. I would be curious as a member of the public uh, as to whether that's been brought to the attention of the city uh, in the past. But you know, I, I do serve a couple of dual purposes, one of which does uh, contain a privilege um, with regard to uh, those closed sessions. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Can I ask one more clarifying question? So under the existing, not the new one, the old one, under the existing municipal code, and for certain closed session matters, um, we city manager could still be the recorder of the minutes, yes, right, for under any the existing code. Yeah. So we don't have to change the municipal code even now to allow the city manager to take that duty, right? But for most of them, maybe city clerk would be better because city manager is already overloaded. <laughs> so taking minutes does take time. And maybe it's proper for most of the things city clerk could be doing the recording. But some matters, um, the current code does allow the city manager to be the designee for, to record minutes, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Qu question here. Okay, go. So if our practice has not been to do this, the municipal code as it stands before we do any enactment doesn't require it except for this resolution we passed two weeks ago. Is that correct? No, it does require it. Yeah, does it require that we're recording uh, what happens yes, in closed sessions? Yes, the municipal code currently requires an official minute book to be kept by the city clerk and for the city clerk to attend every closed session. Okay, all right. I so understand. if we wanted to keep who that- has ac So my question is this, who has access thereafter to the notes that have been recorded by whomever? Only the members of the city council. So if I, I could look back 10 years, if we had done this 10 years ago and I wanted to understand why in the world we had done, uh, why, why in the world did we do that lease with San Jose Water back in the 90s? And this was in effect, right? I could yes. gar glean some further information. So what you're saying is under the Brown Act, even if I wasn't in a closed session, if I'm a current council member, I have the right to see what the, the nature of the discussion was and what decisions were made in closed session. Is that correct? Because that seems, uh, that seems a little contrary to what I'd heard I, before. I think the municipal code... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm asking yeah, the attorney, okay, please. So sorry. It's I'd have to look into that. The, the government code says it's accessible by the city council. Our municipal code says it's accessible by the members of the city council that attended that session. 
Well, okay, so is that oh, something else okay. we need to rectify, yeah. I'm wondering? I think the current code says that attendees have access. It doesn't really say attendee who have to be city council members. It sounds like attendees of that particular court session has access. I mean, right. but Rod's concern is if he wants to look at those minutes from 10 years ago, he couldn't because he was not an or attendee. If I, if I want, if, let's say I'm a current council member, but I uh, had to recuse on an item that was discussed in closed session, uh, would I also have a right to look at the, this minute book? No. So it's subject specific and it depends. And I'm, yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's more cleanup warranted here. Right, so you'd have to redact anything in the minutes if he wanted to see the minutes, but he was recused. The, the resolution specifies that if someone was recused, they don't have access to the minutes for that. Period, item. even right. if there were other closed session items well, there's that they were the, not there's recused a, from. The minutes are for each item, <coughs> so there's not. Okay. It's not a set of minutes for the whole meeting right, like right. we do. Right. No. Okay. So there'll be one uh, page I, for item one, one page right. for item okay. two. I honestly, I'm not. Com I, I think there is some uh, labor efficiency in having city manager do it. I think the city manager is the most senior uh, person we have in this regard. So I'm. I would be fine with it being the city manager, but I uh, don't feel strongly uh, it could also be uh, the clerk. And I recognize there are some sensitive matters where you'd really want the city manager to be the person. So right. It, this I, really, I, I'm, I'm fine with whatever the majority wants to do. I here. thought the reason, one of the reasons was because of sensitive matters that we did this in the first place. I, I, I believe part, well, I'm speculating, but perhaps part of the reason the city clerk isn't attending any of the closed sessions or the practice was stopped is it just facilitates more frank discussions to have somebody who's not at a staff level in the closed sessions. But um, it's a policy decision up to the city council. Right. Well, it seems it. like there's um, at least three people that don't want to proceed with this. So um, that I think that pretty much settles it. I mean, I, I would oh, sorry. I would prefer I, adopting it, but it's, the it's existing not code. Uh, I was not quite correct. The existing code says any minute book described in this section shall be available only to members of the body which held the closed session. So that I right. guess so means that, that was a future people. But okay. I don't know if that includes future council or not. Okay, well I don't think yes. we have to discuss this anymore. It seems like No, I'm sorry. The, no. I, I think that point is really important because how do you interpret that? Is that current members of the body which held the closed session? Are no, you, are you members of the body. It doesn't say current members. Well, but you can impute no, the current. No, you can't impute. And it's, it's really a matter of whether you place your emphasis on members or held. Uh, if you're talking about um, the body which held, that, that would be the Cupertino City Council. But if you're talking about um, the body which held the closed session in the sense that, that the meeting was being held for that particular meeting, then you're limiting it to the members that were there present during that closed session. So this is a matter of interpretation, first of all. Second, I think an, an item that hasn't been discussed is how this is affecting uh, or affected by our records retention policy. So in uh, Rod's example, in 10 years, is this going to be affected by any kind of requirement that we destroy records after a certain amount of time? So that's, I, I'd be very interested in it. Um, I, I agree with Mayor Scharf that we don't have the votes to uh, proceed in second reading. I would request that we revisit the resolution and, and rescind that because they're in direct conflict with each other now. Um, but with respect to the idea of making sure that we are following the municipal code, at the very least in this regard, since this is the topic of our discussion, I would like to um, recommend that we give express uh, direction to, to staff to do so. Um, but with regard to the clarity of um, the very last portion of subsection C, I, I would like to get some clarification as to whether um, the access to these minutes is limited only to the members that were attending a particular closed session. Thank you. Well, and likewise, staffers, right, if you had Let's say we pass the baton right. from one city manager to the next. Would that minute book not be accessible by the, the next city manager? I, I think, I mean, Darcy's intention here, I think, is, 
is right that we do we need some institutional knowledge is that fair yes. that we're, mm -hmm. we're really trying to make sure that you know if we come to fruition with some ideas in a closed session that those are memorialized and available for what I'm assuming your intention is uh, a future city council to really understand why XYZ was done or some such thing is that fair Yes, and, and that's why I pointed out the, and the future city, policy. future city attorney, future city manager. Right. When we're talking about the future, do we destroy these records after a certain number of years yeah. under our policy? So I, I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, personally, I'd I'd rather be able to look back 20 years ago yeah. and yeah. say what was that council thinking and, and with I'd, regard to enacting right. you know a particular yeah. agreement, for instance. So if we could agree on that, maybe staff can can figure out how but to yes. serve something up. For yeah. Us can you just bring it? this back? Yes. Considering, sure. yeah, it's a good point, because what if, like a lease with San Jose Water, which happened so many years ago, we would, the minutes would be destroyed if we actually followed the records retention, which, so we probably shouldn't be doing that, at least for closed session minutes. Yeah, and I, and I will say that the government code is more clear than our municipal code, that the minute book shall be available only to the members of the legislative body. And so I think the intent was that, right. th that future council members may have access to right the because we're members of the right, right. they didn't say member current members right. it's just members yes. so i think we could and what clarify. about senior staff do they have a right to um and it, the government code does not provide that but um we could so i guess I the council like needs could. to authorize that maybe. yeah and I, I mean from from my perspective our two senior employees our city manager and city attorney irrespective of who's taken the notes I, I think it would serve us well to have them have access to this thing. I will Whoever say, those yeah. people we appoint I, to be are. And I, yeah. Or what? <laughs> I will say the government's code is, shall be available only to the members of the legislative body. And right. doesn't you mean we don't have others. a right to make it available to? I think that you know, the members of the legislative body would be able to decide who to share the minutes with right. on I a case-by-case case okay. basis. Okay. So um, regarding some comments about only available to people who attend, I understand that if someone recused, the person shouldn't have access. But if someone simply couldn't attend a closed session because of other things, then I think according to, to the code, uh, that member should still have access to the closed session to understand what I, went on. Right, I because they're a member. The this would be clarified. Would and they are a member of the legislative body, so they right. would have yeah. access. So they should have access. It's not just those who okay. attend. So okay, so have we beaten this to death yet? Okay. Pretty much. Okay, so <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can move on and we are not going to do a second reading, so we're on to... So can we bring back an item to rescind uh, the resolution and the ordinance for next meeting? And uh, an item to discuss if we need to change the current uh, municipal code. I, I would actually bring way. back the whole um, ordinance to okay. amend the code. That's fine. Right. Right. Okay, can we move on to public hearings? This is Municipal Code Amendments to Chapter 19.112, Accessory Dwelling Units, Chapter 19.2, Permitted Conditional and Excluded Uses in Agriculture and Residential Zones, and Chapter 19.08, Definitions for Clarifications and Consistency with Recently Adopted State Bills. Application number MCA-2018-04, Applicant City of Cupertino, Location Citywide. Can we have the staff report? Thank you, Mayor. John Martier, Senior Planner with the City's Community Development Department, and I'm here to present um, application number MCA 2018-04, uh, dealing with consistency, the city's efforts to be consistent with the state, uh, re the state's recently passed uh, uh, Assembly and Senate bills. Okay, so uh, really quick, um, this might be a familiar presentation that a lot of you have seen if you've attended Housing Commission meetings or Planning Commission meetings in the past. Essentially, the, the beginning of this presentation will be a brief overview of what accessory dwelling units are and as to why the state sees them as a necessary cure to the, our housing crisis. So essentially, an ADU is a secondary dwelling unit with complete independent living facilities for one or more persons. Um, there are three main types of ADUs, and if you could take a, just a mental picture of this slide, 
uh, just so you know what those three uh, different types are, because it will be important to understand and fully grasp um, what the state bills, um, and how determine and what they, um, and, and to actually grasp what they mean in terms of uh, streamlined ADUs and non-streamlined ADUs. Um, <clears throat> the first one is an internal um, type of ADU right here, and that's where you see uh, internal conversion, conversion inside a, a, an existing home. Within these um, homes, there's very little to no um, external modifications um, to, the, to the principal dwelling unit. The second is an attached um, ADU, which is uh, typically you would see um, some sort of um, extension of the square footage and uh, the building footprint of the home. And the third type is what many people think of when they think of accessory dwelling units, the granny unit, the secondary dwelling unit right here, where you have, um, for the most part, a, a rear yard um, detached unit, um, some places close to the rear and side property line. Um, very, very rarely are, are they ever in the front, um, in the front yard. Ask something, is, is it allowed for the JADU, attached ADU, to be only on second story? That's also allowed, right? Maybe on top of a garage. If, if it's, yeah, JADUs are exclusively internal conversions. So if there is a space that is above a garage, you could do a conversion of that space. But only converging, you cannot add uh, extra room on top of? No, the only time, no, no, you cannot add extra square footage. You fridge. cannot add. Yeah. So you cannot add an extra room attached to the existing home. No, I that, w I'm sorry. Um, that would be an attached ADU. So JADUs are, are specifically just internal conversions. Oh, uh, wait. So attached ADU, I saw the JADU is attached ADU, so they are separate. Yeah, so I, I can go back to, the, uh, to this previous slide if that, if that helps out. So a JADU would essentially be just this, an internal conversion. Oh, JADU a, means yeah. internal, so this is yeah. a converging. Yeah. Attached would be adding on to existing units. Right here, yes. So it's in addition, that's not converging. Absolutely. Okay, but it could be second story. Yes, you can, yeah, you cannot add square footage to the second story for our ordinance. We'll get more detail to that later on. And do, which of these is called junior ADU? The internal. The, the internal. Only that one is Only the that JADU. one, yeah. Okay. And, we'll, and not all internal ADUs are JADUs, and we'll get into that a little bit more specifically. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Patience <laughs> is a virtue in this presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so the benefits of ADU, uh, the state sees it as a, as I, as I mentioned earlier, as a cure to the, um, the housing crisis, at least somewhat of a cure to the housing crisis in California. Um, they're considered affordable by design. Um, they could provide income for homeowners if they choose to rent them out. Their children move out of the house, empty nesters, they add an ADU, whether internal, attached, or detached, and it could add some extra income to, for, like I said, empty nesters, people who are retired, or just anybody. Um, and they also share independent living areas with family members. Um, we see that quite often as staff. Um, again, this community is very old world in many, many senses. Uh, people come to live in Cupertino. They'll bring um, their parents from abroad over to live with them because they are dependent uh, upon their children. Uh, we also see many cases where um, kids can't afford an apartment. They just graduated college, have their first starter job, and, and you know, they can't afford a separate living facility, but they still want the independence to, to cook on their own or be able to leave without having to run into their parents in the primary dwelling unit. <clears throat> so uh, our proposed changes to the Cupertino Municipal Code, again, uh, providing incentives to build ADUs has been part of our city work program for at least a few years. Um, it is currently part of our work program, the 2019-2020 work program, and it's, the language is right there for you to read, provide incentives to build ADUs, which provide affordable housing opportunities by reviewing ordinance and reducing fees. Um, we did bring um, a proposed uh, incentive and modification to the CMC in June 11, 2020, um, to the Planning Commission. It was a very simple one where we removed the, proposed removing the 10% lot size restriction. That was, a, again, as a reminder, if you had an 8,000 square foot lot, you were limited to a maximum size of ADU to 10% of that, which means you couldn't have anything bigger than 800 square feet. Um, the Planning Commission 
denied a recommendation to City Council one one to three with uh, Takahashi absent since um, we did know it was wasn't a secret that the state was coming down in October potentially to have five to six actually six bills that would incentivize uh, ADU production um, in the future and so in an effort not to do the work to amend the municipal code and then have to undo it potentially in the future, it was decided not to, uh, not to uh, recommend um, any modification at that time and staff followed through with that recommendation. And um, we did that and so here we are at City Council for the first reading. And again, this is the, the language of the municipal code. We're essentially amending three chapters. Um, so here's a very brief synopsis of the six um, state bills that went, th that went through and were approved by the governor in October. AB 68 and AB 881 were the, were the ones that had the, probably the biggest impact where they streamlined um, certain um, ADUs. Um, but all ADUs have a 60-day approval, um, maximum approval period, um, or review period, I should say. Um, it makes certain ADUs exempt from zoning standards, um, sets maximum ADU dimensions. Um, we, SB 13, again, uh, stated that local jurisdictions cannot require owner residence. Um, Cupertino hasn't had that in a while, uh, but some surrounding cities, such as Sunnyvale, did have that um, restriction. And um, I did underline the second bullet point under SB 13, where it said it cannot impose impacts on ADUs under 750 square feet. Uh, many of you who um, have listened, or have heard residents talk about uh, what prevented them from adding ADU. Probably one of the biggest reasons why they didn't do it is because of the impact fees, uh, our park fees and whatnot. So uh, the state um, basically said that any ADU, regardless of attached uh, internal conversion or detached, if it's under 750 square feet are exempt from any type of impact fees. So, so is the state going to be backfilling that lost revenue to us? <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I think you, <laughs> I think you do know. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a rhetoric, sorry. How much, <laughs> how much of the fees, of the impact fees are we talking about? Let's say it's 800 square feet. How much will be the impact fee? So, so let's just say the park mitigation fee as an example. That has been in the past $15,000, uh, around $15,000. So if you're under a 750 square feet, you don't have to pay that fee. If you're above that, um, it would be based on the proportion, its proportionality with the size of the, of the principal dwelling unit and the density on the lot. Um, Public Works takes in that fee, and what they, what they have stated is that it won't be in excess of $15,000. Mm. Right, so if you go to 751, you, you pay the fee. You pay, you the, pay fee. the whole fee. It's yeah. not saying, oh, yeah. they, so they don't say only the square feet over 750 pay the fee that's At the ice, so that this is going to this is kind of going to discourage people from building larger ADUs i i would imagine potentially yeah potentially. i mean if it, if it was a choice between 750 and 800 they go uh, to 750 if it was yeah. 1500 they said, probably say okay we'll just pay it yeah i mean my experience with uh, folks developing in the city they, is that they like to skirt the limits <laughs> what they can do in terms of sizes and whatnot so right okay so can you um for let's say 750 square feet on um, what exactly are all the all the fees that um a person have to pay right now could you give us a number sometime later i, I couldn't uh, give you the exact park. yeah I, I couldn't give you the exact number um it would be traffic impact fee it would be park mitigation fee the school fees is taken in by the school district and i don't know those numbers um, we had come with a, a, with a calculation a few years back, um, it was over, over $20,000 if you include even the, the permitting fees and whatnot. You still pay building permit fees. They still pay yeah. permit it's, fees. It actually right? is reduced because we, that was one of the incentives that we did do a few years back where we, we reduced the um, permitting fees for ADUs to a, a fraction of what you, what you would pay for a single family home. Oh well, wait, so we reduced the permit fees for the ADU? Because that was a council work item. It was to find ways to incentivize. So, oh, we but now because they are not paying impact fees, maybe we shouldn't have reduced the permit fees. 
Well, they're, they're two separate items. I mean, permit fees are, are basically the review that the permit permitting staff and um, and uh, city, not city engineers, but the um, uh, permit techs take. Yeah, it needs to be based on actual work. Yes. But if we have, if we reduce that fee, that means we are subsidizing, um, not on top of the impact fees, we are subsidizing these units. Yeah, we want more of these units, but still, that come at a cost to the city general fund if we are subsidizing the permit fees, right? So I would like to know exactly how, what dollar amount are we subsidizing, so at least we know. Well, I, I, um, I apologize, I don't have those numbers okay. off the top of my head. My right planning now. would have to yeah. come up with how much it costs, um, um, later you how can much they get spend. Back. Um, mm -hmm. So the schools cannot impose impact fees either, right? I, I believe just, so, yeah. Despite the fact yeah. that it's likely to be school, add, um, add more, kids to the schools okay okay so the rest um, are the last three are pretty much um, just state the Friedman had a couple uh, AB 587 AB 670 um, one discussed that uh, you can actually convey ownership of ADUs only in very certain circumstances uh, AB 670 uh, prevents homeowner associations from barring ADUs it doesn't say they can't completely um, Basically, they, they can't overly restrict the, the development. Right. Values, so. If it's uh, obviously if it was like a condo complex, you probably couldn't put it in. But if it's a housing complex that has a homeowners association, that, correct. Right. And we'll, yeah, I mean, a condo complex would be considered a multifamily development. Yeah. Typically, and we can get more into what what those regulations um, are. So AB five eighty seven, mm -hmm. if it's sold, does that need a new parcel map to subdivide that because it would be two parcels then right uh not necessarily it would just be a i guess we consider an air right sarah Good, good evening. Right. I'm Sarah Clark with the City Attorney's Office. Um, AB 587 has really limited application. It's really designed to accommodate desires by a couple of housing trusts to allow separate conveyances of ADUs. And the, that separate conveyance would be similar to a condo. So the land, land parcel would remain with the owner of the primary unit. Um, but it would just be the, the owner of the actual building, the actual ADU, could be conveyed separately. So no, mo no parcel map would be required. Well, I mean, my, my worry is for schools that they have a parcel tax to fund the schools, and now there's two units, but they can only collect one parcel tax. Sure, I, I understand like that. Like an apartment building. Yeah, right? I understand that concern. I th my impression of AB 587 is that it it would be very surprising to see more than one or two of these in Cupertino, if any. I think the requirements for meeting this standard, um, because of the type of uh, organization that is required to hold the separate unit, the restrictions, all these have to be affordable units, um, they have to be deed, con deed restricted, I just think it's very unlikely to okay, be used. Okay, great, thank so you. So it's more like uh, mobile homes. Yes, on exactly. A prime, on a private property. That's right. And the requirement is, I think, non certain specific nonprofits. Yes, that's correct. Only they can do that. Yes. Okay. And, but these nonprofits, some of them can be very big. And yes. And they have been, they could be purchasing up a lot of single family homes to convert them to rentals and this kind of ADUs. Certainly, there's no restrictions on that. I, I don't think that's likely, however. Mm. Okay. okay, is this okay. present? You have more for the presentation? Quite a bit more, yes. Okay, continue. Because then I have one speaker card when you're done. Okay. Okay, uh, going on. Uh, so, basically, a summary of changes and incentives. Um, overall, high level summary is that the the state really want to exempt ADUs from certain development standards that, that they saw were inhibiting. Uh, more development of these ADUs, such as you know, floor area ratios, lot coverages for certain types of ADUs, um, uh, what they saw as um, overbearing setbacks and, and whatnot. Um, they also want to make construction of ADUs more affordable with reduction of certain fees, like we just discussed. Um, allow ADUs in non single family zoned yeah. areas, such as multifamily, uh, existing multifamily developments, and essentially reduce the review time for permitting. 
So those are really kind of the four overarching summary of changes and incentives that the state wanted to pass down to local jurisdictions. Can you just say <clears throat> something about that floor area ratio? Do, does it change beyond the current floor area ratio limit? So what the state has basically said is that cities cannot um, reduce the ability to have an 800 square foot unit on, on any um, single family site, for example. So if and we'll go into this further, but if you have, um, so let's just take a regular R1 neighborhood, right? Where you have 45% FAR limitations. If someone goes in there and has, uh, wants to propose a 600 square foot ADU, but they're already at like 44.5% FAR, they will probably have the ability to, they will have the ability to add that ADU despite the fact that they will go above the FAR. Now, if they come in with an 802 square foot ADU and with a 44 point, and they have an existing 44.5% FAR, you cannot, we, we would not allow that to happen. So on, on anything that's 800 square feet and below would be exempt from those lock coverage or, F or floor area ratio um, standards that we have. So someone building a house could say, wow, I really want to exceed that floor area ratio. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll build part of this as an ADU, but I'm not going to rent it out. I'm just going to use it for myself as a way to get around the FAR limit. Well, there's certain design standards. So, for example, we they would it would have to be completely separate from right. the rest of the house and whatnot. And it's it's fine. They don't have to rent it yeah. out. I mean, there's nothing in the ADU ordinance that says you have to rent it out. You could just have your mother or father live there or your child right. live there too. So you'd have to have the separate. Uh, Living facilities, completely independent. Right, yeah, okay, facilities. I got it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sure. So does that apply to the attached ADU? No. Attached well, ADU would still be, have to be constrained by the FAR requirement? So any type of ADU, attached, detached. Um, but you just said that if um, we, we would have to allow 800 square foot ADU regardless right. of the standard. So does that include the attached ADU yes. or does that have to be deattached? Right. So an attached you'd really be it would really be a good way of getting around the FAR limit to just, you know, put in a tiny kitchen there and now it's uh you've exceeded the FAR even though it's not your you have no intention of really it being an ADU. Well, the, again, there's certain design standards they have to maintain. Again, mm. kitchen, living facilities, mm. bathroom. Right, so. but if you if you were adding a master suite, you'd definitely be putting in a bathroom anyway, and a kitchen. You know, you can put in a tiny kitchen with a. You know, well, you've sure. seen, if you've seen some in-law units, you know. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. Well, you know what yeah. some of those kitchens look like. But, I mean, it is what it is. This is a state law, and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, we have to live with it. I'd, I'd just like to say that, you know, we're, what we're doing is conforming to state law, yeah. which is something we do in many different areas. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and what might be really useful uh, as you draw the presentation to a close is to, to help us understand where we have any discretion and what your sure. specific recommendations yeah. are on yeah. that. Thank because you. Yeah, absolutely. Because that, yeah. that really, I mean... For those of you who may like this or those of you who may not like it, we have to do what the state mm. requires. We have to conform. Yeah. Otherwise, people get confused and they say they come down on us, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's the what's discretionary part, mm -hmm. and I think that's where the nub of this discussion ought to be. Mm. Yeah. All right. So let me, so let me just, again, so each, you, each house primary parcel can have one J A D U and one A D U, right? So one, one internal converging and one attached or deattached. Right. Yes, one J A D U, and I'll get to that too. Yeah. And one okay. detached A D U. Now, why don't we let him finish okay. the presentation and then take public comment and then ask any more questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here all night. So continue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so let me just go by really quickly now um, through the parts of the ordinance that we're changing. So. Um, Chapter 1908, which is our definition section, we are uh, amending our uh, actual accessory dwelling unit definition to include junior accessory dwelling units. Again, internal conversion of existing space, no larger than 500 square feet. Um, what makes this a little different than, let's say, an attached ADU or, or a regular 
uh, any other type of internal conversion is that you can have uh, a shared bathroom with a principal dwelling unit. Okay, but you have to have a, a, your own kitchen and, and sleeping facilities separate. And these are deed restricted. So you finish it prior to a, a certificate of occupancy, you would um, submit a deed with the county. Uh, single family residence, um, we amended this definition to um, conform with the state's definition of a single family residence, which basically means that um, a single family lot would be one dwelling unit located on a separately owned lot. Uh, uh, how is that different from our current uh, definition? What makes a difference? So this would include townhomes. Mm -hmm. So anything that they may be attached, but they actually have their own lot. Right. Yeah. yeah, so townhomes may be even attached to each other. Correct. They have their own lot. They would now be able to add ADUs. Right, right. At least 800 square feet. If, if they could fit. I mean, there's right. still setback requirements, right. yeah. Very minor setback. Yeah. Um, living space, again, this is just uh, the, the state ordinance or the state bill, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry the, the government code actually changed some of the numbering of the, of the um, of the uh, state code. So the new bills changed some of the number of the state code, so we were just conforming our definition to, to reflect that. Um, 1920, again, just, um, just permitting um, ADUs in some of the higher density uh, zones, such as R1C, R2, which is primarily duplexes, and R3, which is our multifamily zones. So this is really where the meat and potatoes is in terms of our, our amendments, is 1912 accessory dwelling units. So again, uh, no impact fees on any ADU or JDU less than 750. Um, ADUs are not to be used as short-term rentals. Um, streamline ADUs, JDUs, and single-family development. Uh, again, these, are, um, these include internal conversions and detached ADUs under 800 square feet. Oh, so, sorry to... Can you go back to the last slide? Sure. So a JADU is already defined as less than 500 square feet, right? Correct. Yeah. So isn't this a little redundant? Well, it's, yeah, it's just a, it, this is just a summary. The okay. actual ordinance spells out. All right, out. okay, yeah. sorry, go. So again, um, as mentioned before, it's one per lot unless detached um, ADU and a JADU are in the same spot. Uh, same lot, excuse me. Um, does not impact the FAR lot coverage open space requirements. Setbacks reduced to four feet for detached structures, uh, whereas before, you know, it was based upon the, the wall plane. And no parking requirement. And um, per Councilman Sinks, these are all, we have no discretion over these, if I make that clarification. Um, a brand new category that the state added was uh, streamline ADUs and multifamily development. So there's two types of uh, ADUs you can have in multifamily development. Uh, one is the internal, the first is the internal conversion of non-livable space. This includes any types of, the, the state gives an example of a boiler room that's not used anymore. Um, maybe a parking structure that's not being used. Again, this is for existing multifamily. So if someone wants to build an apartment building and they throw, oh, I have ADUs in my plans, that, that, that doesn't count. It has to be built, it's occupied, and they're just converting non-livable space. Um, the, we, any multifamily um, development has to be allowed at least one, if they so choose to, but no more than 25% uh, of the existing number of uh, primary dwelling units. So that means that if you have a duplex, you want to convert some, some attached or some non-livable portion of that duplex to an ADU that's above 150 square feet, that we, we have to allow them at least that one. Um, detached ADUs, uh, no more than two detached accessory dwelling units are permitted per lot. Uh, maximum size for those is 1,200 square feet and um, four foot uh, from side and rear lot lines. So one junior ADU and two detached ADU will be allowed well, the, so, so, is, yeah, so no more than two detached ADUs are permitted per lot. Oh, sorry. Multifamily. Yeah. So no matter how many, how big is the multifamily development. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So you can have. They can have only two. You can have a five-unit apartment building that if they if they can't so fit it in there. 
If it's a, it were an 80 units apartment building, they can have only two or Correct. So. Right. Correct. Interesting. And for the JADU, not exceed 25% of the units. So this is not percent of the square footage. Right. It's, it's off the of units, yeah. And, oh. and just a clarification, uh, um, oh. Councilman, uh, um, there's J JADUs don't exist in multifamily. They only, they only exist in single family. Just right. a matter oh. of just a matter of clarification. What about uh, uh, garage conversions? That's that's part of it. That's yeah. Wait, you say this is uh, for this is multifamily, and yes. this is not JADU. No, uh, JADUs are only in single family. Then internal converging here is not called a JADU. It's called a yeah. attached ADU. No, it's, it's an internal conversion. So internal conversions can be either JADU. Or just if they're above 500 square feet, then there's just simply an internal conversion, and there's no limit to size on these oh. either. So this is considered still one ADU, so at most two, either attached or deattached. So you can have so the limits on internal conversions are minimum one if it's like for example a duplex, and no more than 25 percent of the existing units. But isn't there a limit of more than no more than two? That's for detached. For detached. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So <laughs> sorry. So, so it could be well, more. Okay. Yeah, so uh, count, yes. For the R one, oh. I believe there is a garage requirement. So, how does that play out if they convert the garage? Are they required to add a garage? No. No. So they're allowed to convert the garage and then just okay. outdoor parking? Exactly. Yeah. This will go on a long time. Yes. Okay, continue. Okay, so uh, non-streamlined ADUs in single family development. And again, this is where we do have some discretion on, on some items. So what the state said is that um, we have to allow, we cannot. Prohibit. We cannot prohibit, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm almost at a loss of words, too. So 850 square feet, no, no larger than 850 square feet for studios and one bedroom, and no larger than 1,000 square feet for more than one bedroom. Um, some cities have allowed more than that, where they say, we'll, we'll just allow 1,200 square feet ADUs across the board. Um, we decided to take the approach as the minimum the state w allows for the maximum is going to be our maximum. So we really kind of towed the line of what um, what we felt was the state can let us get away with and without having to go above and beyond. And it's really up to council. If you want to go right. above that, you can go above that. Um, attached to existing single family dwellings shall not be exceed 50%. So again, that attached ADU um, cannot be above, can, cannot be larger than 50% of the living space of the, uh, of the principal dwelling unit. So that excludes garage area, attic right. space, okay. and stuff like that too. Um, so for units, regardless if they're attached or, or detached, if they're above 800 square feet, you are limited by lock coverage, floor area ratio, open space um, standards and whatnot. Uh, however, setbacks are reduced to four feet, and in certain circumstances, you, are, you do have some parking requirements. Um, one revision of the draft ordinance that, um, that we saw fit, but after, pretty much after the staff report was posted was um, a clarification to living space. And we want to make sure that all attic, so we ask, whatever you see is underlined right here is what we're proposing to add to the living space definition that all attic and basement square footage proposed as part of an accessory dwelling it shall be limited by the maximum size allowed per chapter 1912. And the, the, the 112, in uh, the, the thought behind this was that at, um, attics in, well, in most case, in all cases, uh, basements on principal dwelling units don't count against FAR. Right. But if you can use it as part of your ADU, we would count that FAR as part of it. Huh. So. Okay. So, how I I know that the the height limit is sixteen feet. Correct. And uh, anything over twelve feet, we count, we double count, it, right? In it, in square foot in floors, uh, square footage. So do we still do that for all the ADUs? If they are over 12 feet, we double count the square footage? We double count over 16 feet. Hmm? We double count over 16 feet. Not 12 feet? Not, not 12 feet. I thought we double count uh, over 12, anything over 12 feet. 
16 feet, I believe. That's the, the Volco project, I remember. It wasn't 16. So 16 feet is for, for single family homes. We double count. We double count yeah, anything that's feet. over 16 feet. So Correct. for these ADUs, likely there won't be any double count. Pretty but much. You're including attic and basement. Yeah. And, and one thing to note, too, we used to allow ADUs to be up to 20 feet, but we're, we have the ability to reduce it to 16, and that's what we chose to do. In height. In height. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Is this it? Or you have more? Um, just the just kind of a recap of who we presented this to. We did present this to the Housing Commission. Um, they expressed some interest in incentivizing parking and incentives exchange for affordable deed restrictions. And so essentially, if someone wants to, to, to encourage or incentivize afford, the affordability levels of, of the, of the um, ADUs, uh, we can give some, some type of further incentives. Nothing was given to us specifically. So that's yeah, just I mean, incentivizing parking would be great since you're, you know, actually losing parking if you're yeah. doing the garage conversion, yeah. plus you're having more cars. Yeah. Um, so any specific recommendations on how to incentivize parking from Housing Commission? None. It was just, just kind of a, just a thought out there. Right. Okay. And last was Planning Commission. Uh, there was a vote on January 28th to adopt the resolution to recommend the council that they adopt the, the draft ordinance. Uh, we did it, staff at the hearing did include amendments that the ADUs must be separate from the primary residence, uh, with the exception of JADUs that share bathroom facilities with the primary residence. Uh, other than that, there has to be a complete separation. Ah, but not on detached, right? I mean, it, yes, There's by no design, separation. you're separate already, right. so. So actually I have a question on how do you define separate? I mean, you could add an ADU separate wall, but mm -hmm. the roof could be connected. Mm -hmm. And then there could be even a hallway that's really connected. And it could be just a way to add an additional room to the house. Mm -hmm. But then how do you define separate? So basically, you, so the way the ordinance reads is that there's no interior doors or other connection be between the units. So, I mean, obviously, yes, you could have a connected roof. I mean, that just makes a seamless, connect, it's a seamless design to the, to the principal dwelling unit if you're doing that attached um, ADU. But we just say you can't have interior doors or, or any other type of connections inside. That would, you know, to, to express the mayor's concern earlier, that you, someone's just basically adding a, a massive bedroom yeah. to get over the FAR. Yeah. There's no connection, though. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, you can still connect. Uh, the roof could be connected. There yeah, could sure. be some landscaping or, or glass wall yeah. that connect that them. that doesn't matter. If it's just connected. innovative design, but then this is okay. a, another way to go beyond the FAR. Okay. I, I can answer that question really quickly. Yeah. I mean, there still has to be building code standards and fire code standards, too. I mean, could a glass wall meet building code? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, Is the, can you clarify how we de actually define separate? Can we ensure they are actually a separate a ADU not being used to just add sure. 850 feet, square feet? <laughs> sure. So uh, the, the building code, if you're a separate unit, if you're an ADU, it has to be treated like a separate unit so it has to be fire rated walling in between you know again i'm not right. a, i'm not a plan checker i'm not someone who's a, a in the build, in, an expert on building codes but there is a, a distinct clear separation between the the units themselves right okay not, okay so it, yeah that's good information okay uh is that it or more no, that's yeah that's it <laughs> okay so i have three sure. um speaker cars jennifer griffin lisa warren and Daniel Boxer, welcome, Jennifer. Um, good evening, City Council. I'll start off by my apologies to our city staff. This is going to be a brutal, brutal battle for the ADUs. And I apologize, that's why we have good city staff. You guys aren't, when we went through FAR and R1, it was a hell of a battle. And this, FAR, this ADU thing is the worst abuse of power by the state, by the people that wrote these ADU bills. It is an insult to every resident of the state. Mm 
They are treating their constituents like they were stupid children. Well, I'm sorry. I am not going to let some group of people in San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley dictate to the rest of the state and override every zoning law in every city and every county. They think, so we're supposed to believe that everything we have and hold dear in our cities and our zoning is stupid. Stupid. This is what our politicians have set us up for. And I hope they're listening because this is an insult why everything that I have come here for 20 years in this city and fought hours over, F-A-R, the trees, everything is mute. If you're allowing one of these god-awful units to be four feet from the property line, what right do they have to dictate and take away our local rights? This is why we spent hours defeating SB 50. We are living the hellhole of SB 35 every day, and we will continue to live it. Why do our politicians hate us? I'm sorry. Please listen, Sacramento. There will be pushback. But these are unconstitutional laws. Every one of these ADU bills are illegal and unconstitutional. I didn't get to vote for them. People who write these bills, we don't know where the money's coming from. I think people know where the money's coming from. But I didn't vote for the people that wrote these bills. These are idiotic bills. They are unconstitutional. And they're overriding and taking away local control. This is as bad as SB 50, and it's the hellhole that SB 35 is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Next is Lisa Warren, followed by um, Daniel Boxer. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to rattle off, and then I'm going to show pictures, cute little drawings. So. Um, on the review process, the red line removes where structures should be compatible with the architectural style of the principal structure. Can that not be left in? Is that, isn't that that not discretionary? Um, one question. Building envelope. Do we have building envelope rules for these structures? And another question. Can eave depth be defined? The overhang from the wall plane? Because I was told earlier that the four foot setback is from the back and the side is for the wall plane, not the eaves. And if that's true, is there a defined maximum of the eave depth? If not, we've got a big problem. And if that's not discretionary, that's crazy. Um, can decks and patios be covered on these units? Because there's some language in here with the exception of decks, but if decks can be covered with a roof, then that's a whole other animal. Are lofts permitted? And if they're not, or it's ambiguous, can they be forbidden in your language? <coughs> because I know people have built units in the back of, and they had to stay within a footprint, so they put a sleeping loft. Um, I want to know if that's OK. Any <coughs> clarification as to the setbacks between buildings? I was told before that it's four feet between buildings within a lot, which seems crazy to me. Um, so those are my questions. Here's a, a scenario where four lots all have ADUs in their back corners that are all like this. If you have four feet and a two foot eave, you've got two feet between structure and most likely a wooden fence. And all of these the things are a fire hazard and we already have established that the rules for fire sprinklers don't make any sense and in many cases won't be required. This is what you could be looking at, not good. Um, John, I think you said that roofs could be connected. I find that hard to believe, and if it can't, uh, we couldn't connect something in a project of ours. Um, and that then you said distinct, clear separators between units. That's not a connecting roof, so that didn't match up. Here's my drawing of roof styles. Can you dictate? require certain roof styles. If you have a gable roof and when I came in late 
and I'm sorry, this, I just scribbled this. You were showing pictures and drawings of roof styles on some of the samples. If you have a gable roof, technically two sides at least can go straight up the 16 feet. So if you have that on your fence line, you, you're looking at 16 feet, not you know 10 feet and a sloped roof. Hip roofs are much more appropriate for that kind of stuff. And if flat roofs are allowed, then the whole thing can go straight up at 16 feet. Plus, if that eave, which people like to do now, is make like a three foot eave, you're at the fence okay. line with your roof. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. So can you answer, for, for the setback of four feet, is it the wall or is it the eave of the roof from the property line? Whatever is inclusive of structure, so it could be it could be the wall. Oh, what do you so mean? so if it's the wall and the roof extends over, that's well, the roof we, could extend over the rest of the four feet all the way to the property line. We do have limits on, on eve depth. I, eve, eve depth, I believe. I think it's uh, I, think it's, I believe it's two feet. Again, the the building fire codes do have restrictions on how close you can get to a property line. Um, but right, but those, yeah, but even if we had restrictions based on fire codes, those would be overridden by, by the ADU law, wouldn't they? No. no, they still have to meet. So one of the things that maybe I should make clear is that any type of development of ADU has to meet building and fire codes. Okay. Yeah. So do we have a setback requirement so you could get you know, fire equipment, I mean, you can't, probably can't get it in a four feet area from the fence. That would be kind of hard. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, all, all applications are, are reviewed by the fire department, or by, you know, the, the county fire. And so they can make that determination. Um, if, if four feet's too close, depending on where you're at, I mean, they, they, they'll make that determination that it can't be, but... Um, I mean, typically, even right now, you can be as, actually as close as three feet with, uh, with the current accessory dwelling unit ordinance or any accessory structure if your wall height is... Right, if the wall height right, is, is seven okay. feet. Yeah, so, I mean, we already have less restrictive standards and ordinance right. currently. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm. Now, next I have okay. Daniel Bach. So let, let, let's finish the public comment. For, okay, what? Go. Um, she mentioned whether the decks and patio could be covered. What, what would be the re restriction to, so decks and patio won't be counted as uh, the square footage, right? Right, right. well, it, it wouldn't. No, so could they be covered and then be turned into a room? So decks and patios aren't, um, the regulations of decks and patios are not being changed by this ordinance or affected in any way. I'm not, I'm not sure what but, her comments. But patio on uh, ways that's covered can be easily turned into an additional room. Uh, no, because room. Um, in order to be a, a space, an accessory structure that is converted to an ADU, it needs to be an existing enclosed space. And so a deck or patio wouldn't count as an ADU conversion. Right, and it could be done illegally by it someone. It could be. Yeah. Sure. Used, yeah. uh, but, but not. It could be anything, but that's subject yeah. to city code enforcement. Right. Anything can <laughs> okay. be done illegally, and, and we have a lot of illegal. One other question she has is, would loft be permitted? I guess with 16 feet high, you could have a loft sleeping area. I, I, and I, that I, won't be counted as a separate second floor, right? Yeah, but with a loft, you'd have to have a separate entrance. It couldn't be connected. And so I, I, I guess, so a lot, mm. I mean, no, how not, do you make? Not, not, I think you have seen design, it's the same room, but the sleeping area is lifted. So that uh, below the sleeping area <coughs> is maybe a living room and uh, on top you can sleep. And so I guess that kind of loft, the square footage wouldn't count in the 800 square foot. I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to envision this in my head right now. So it's a loft itself. I mean, without going too much in the weeds on, on, cause there's, there's thousands of different scenarios we can come up with. Yeah. But. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So let's not come up with all of them here okay. tonight. As long as it's within 16 right. feet. Uh, right. So let's move on to the next speaker. 
Daniel Boxer, followed by um, someone with no name except email Joan Meehan. So welcome, Daniel. Good evening. Um, I just found some contradictions um, here. It says accessory dwelling units must comply with site development regulations and guidelines specified in the zoning districts for dwelling units, including but not limited to lot coverage, floor area ratio. So I thought the whole purpose of this was uh, you didn't like, in our instance, the most compared to our lot and our house, the most area we can add to the current regulation is 400 square feet. But I thought the purpose of this was so that you could add, you could add a, an additional dwelling unit of more. But this is saying that you have to comply with the floor area ratio. Okay, yeah, can you answer? The last sentence kind of clears everything up. It says, except as those standards are modified by this chapter. Oh, <laughs> okay, never mind. All right, so then the, uh, the next one is, um, I don't know how you could have an accessory, an attached dwelling unit and not increase the size of the existing structure. It says here, in height and setbacks, the, the accessory dwelling unit shall not increase the size of the existing structure. So how can you attach something and not increase the size of the existing structure. Uh, these are, um, through the mayor, uh, these are conversions right. of interior space. So it's right. not Right, this attached. is not an exterior or attached. This is if you're converting a garage or a utility room, whatever. Oh, okay, so then the, okay. All right, that answers my questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I have uh, Joan. No name Joan. No name Joan. I'm no name Joan. Um, uh, thank you. I understand that um, the city is just struggling to meet the requirements of the state law, so I'm not challenging that. But I had a question about occupancy limits. For example, the HUD has a approximately 250 square feet limit in HUD projects. And one of the things that <laughs> I'm struggling with, since I live in uh, our... One C <laughs> is uh, density, and we have shared common areas. So I'm wondering, will it be you know 50 square feet per person, or 100 square feet per person, or um, you know, will it be, uh, for example, in tenement housing in New York, when they had when they had their housing crisis in the 1800s, it was uh, one toilet for every 20 people. Um, and so I'm wondering about um, toilets. Um, shared common areas, um, m over capacity, over density, and mostly in these in a HUD, in a, a HOA environment because that's where I live, but also f certainly citywide. Um, so I'm wondering about. It. I guess my question is: is can we limit something on square footage, uh, maximum people per toilet? You know, I'm not familiar with building codes and fire codes, so I'm kind of a blind man touching an elephant. I don't know if this is... Okay. I don't think they specified anything regarding... So there are limits set by the fire code, but they're very high. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and beyond that, the city doesn't have the constitutional ability to limit the number of people that live in spaces. So. Um, unfortunately, the answer is, is generally no, is no. We, we, okay. we can't, we can't restrict enough. that um, beyond like true overcrowding fire safety issues. Um, but I don't think that's what you are getting at here. Well, uh, I'm suggesting that it would be handy uh, not to have, you know, one person in less than 50 square feet. That would be my suggestion. I think if HUD figured out 250, maybe that's a realistic or a reasonable uh, level. It, uh, housing and urban development, yeah. Um, and so what I'm wondering, within our limits of the law, because I'm not familiar with them, um, is there something that we could do, <laughs> or I, should do? First is, can we, then should we? If I may, um, yeah. I, I don't believe there's anything that we can if do. If we can't, then yeah. the, we don't have to go to the next question. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's my so question. 
Are you saying that um, there is currently some requirement somewhere of 50 square foot per person no. for a common area? No. No, that would be in the 1800s in the tenement housing in New York. Oh, that I was okay. referring to. Okay. So that was their housing <coughs> crisis. So then, could um, HOA make their own requirement on um, set their own standard? Um, sure. So there's there were changes to state law um, in this most recent cycle about the ability of HOAs to limit ADUs. Uh, what it what the requirements say is that HOAs can no longer prohibit or unreasonably restrict accessory dwelling units. The limits of that have not been tested in the court yet, but that, that implies to me that there can be some restrictions, and so it will be mm -hmm. up for HOAs to determine what levels of restrictions they want to impose and feel like they can so under state law. So it sounds like they, they are required to allow it, yes. but then they get to set this kind of living standard, like a number of um, square foot per person or number of person per, 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 per toilet. Yep. So HOA yep. are... If, if we can't do per to. square footage, how about toilets? Anything we can do on toilets? No. I think she, <laughs> yeah, okay, she, that's I my think, other, those are my two options, I, square footage and toilets. That's actually, it. what I heard is she says HOA can require that. Yes. Yeah. You can HOA, I'm not, you're you not the set. HOA, so yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But the CT yeah. cannot require that? No. Yeah. Uh, Mike, can, Mike, you answered my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, if there's a townhouse complex and somebody wants to convert their garage into a um, junior ADU, um, they're allowed to do that. Yeah, so a junior ADU can't go in a garage, but they could oh, do an okay. interior conversion okay. of that garage space. That would be permitted. Wait, so what could go in a garage then if you can't convert a garage? Well, it's just that junior ADUs are a very limited, specific type of ADU. Okay. They have to be deed restricted, have to have owner occupancy, and they um, can share those bathroom facilities. Right. Um, but interior conversion ADUs or wholly within ADUs are permitted in garages. And so if a, if a townhome owner, and we're talking about a townhome. But that would have to have a bathroom and a kitchen. That would have to have a bathroom and a kitchen, right. okay. yes. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Uh, now my concern is a lot of townhouse complexes, they say, you know, car, basically the garage is for car storage. You don't get any spaces outside of that. So the person, if they did the conversion, they'd have to park somewhere else off, off property, I guess, because they couldn't require, they couldn't require that the homeowners association allow parking. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, kind of getting yeah. into gray areas. Okay. <laughs> all right, very good. So um, that is all the cards. So any more discussion? Rod, do you have any more discussion? Yeah, I, I was interested. If, if you could just come back and summarize those points on which we have discretion. If at all, and, and how you came up with the staff recommendation. Sure. Um, most of our discretion has to do with the non-streamlined ADUs. Again, those are the attached ADUs of any size, which means that you're mm -hmm. attached to the principal dwelling unit and it gets could be an attached that's ADU that's a 200 square foot addition or you know a mm. 800 square foot addition. We have discretion on on, on things over those and also um, detached ADUs over 800 square feet. And what is your recommendation for the discretion? So our recommendation in terms of maximum size for studios and one bedrooms is 850, mm -hmm. and um, for two <clears throat> bedrooms is uh, 1,000 square feet, and that's really kind of the, the, the limit of what the state can say we can't uh, in terms of the, the minimum sizes. Again, some other jurisdictions, such as the county, um, such as um, City of San Jose, have allowed ADUs up to 1,200 square feet. Yeah. And so, but we felt that, you know, just judging by the mood of the community and what we, the feedback we've gotten, uh, just try to make it as, as modest as possible, unless council decides to go with the 1,200 square foot option. Yeah, I, I personally would uh, think we might incent more people to move at a higher size. So I'd, I'd be willing to go higher, and I'd be interested to see what my housing-friendly colleagues on the council want to do. <laughs> um, I, you know, um, 
I had, we had had Wachowski come to the Cities Association, and I challenged this idea that these things are naturally affordable, right? And, and was hoping that he might consider an amendment that would give us some room to uh, provide an incentive, right? If we want to retain teachers in our community and we were able to somehow get them into either a, a BMR program, you know, deed restrict them for a certain number of years in exchange for uh, agreeing to rent for some under market uh, thing, allowing us, to, for example, uh, a, a big incentive could be waiving the fees because our part fee right now for ADUs is really high. I don't, I've, how much is it that we're? 15, 15K, yeah. It, uh, 15 K, yeah. Before that state law kicked into effect, wasn't it higher? No? No. Okay, but still, that's a, that could be a big trading point. But mm -hmm. Wachowski said, no, it's naturally affordable. We're not giving you any, any discretion on that. So, okay, so, so I get it. But uh, that, that'd be my only thing to, to consider um, opening up things uh, a, a little to allow somewhat bigger units in this discretion. Yeah. I mean, I think the size is, is large enough. I mean, look at... Look at these SB35 units that are going in. Um, they're what 350 something square feet. So I think we're. I think by adopting what the state has um, as the minimums, I, I think we're. we're I, I think we're fine. Um, the larger they get, and remember, there's no parking requirements. Um, the more congestion we get, the more. Um, the more need for the infrastructure that there are no, well, there would be fees over, over 750 anyway. But yeah, I, I think the limit, I, I would not favor going larger. Um, so I think I'm willing to consider bigger 1200 square feet provided they provide parking, right? We can add more restrictions if they go bigger. And we, can we? We cannot. Because then it's not streamlined. Or we can only allow bigger units if the lot is plenty, there is ample space. Can we possibly define it in a way that 1,200 square foot will be allowed under limited circumstances? Right. If it's a, if it's a huge lot, I mean, that's... If it's a huge lot and it's large enough that they are paying the fees, that, yeah, that, then yeah. that's a little different. So I, I hear your um, policy um, argument for that and for wanting to incentivize things that we want um, or for treating larger units um, or larger lots as more accommodating. Um, the state law is, is pretty poorly drafted and unfortunately really limits the city's discretion to to make these policy trades. And so for instance, on parking, um, the state law is very clear that in many circumstances, the city just cannot require parking. And even though I, I hear what you're asking for in the, in the sense of, oh, well, well, we could allow it to go larger if we could in exchange get parking. We want to negotiate. Right? We want to negotiate, exactly. We want to, uh, we'll um, give you something if and yes. Bigger setbacks. Four yes. feet is too <laughs> narrow, but then if it's large enough, eight feet. Yes, exactly. Maybe Maybe the no. But the no. way that state law is drafted is they don't anticipate that kind of bargaining. They say if you're going to allow A to use, then in these circumstances, then you have to apply these very prescriptive standards. And so for that reason, I think it's part of why staff came forward with, we're going to take the most um, restrictive approach possible because we already are giving away so much. Um, so we can pass an ordinance that complies with state law, and that's fine. Can, outside of state law, could we approve another unit that was larger, that, uh, that required parking? Yeah, with exceptions? I, I think that the safest way to do this legally would be to call those something else. Right, and so, yeah. <laughs> so it's not, no longer an ADU. No longer an ADU, it's, it's just a second, a second unit, unit or whatever. Okay, yeah, we go thank back you. to Granny Flats, whatever right. you want to so call it. We can do that, we just call it something else. Yes. Right. And with totally separate standards. Yes. <laughs> okay? Right. I'm willing to consider that. Right, yeah, so, so that wouldn't be part of the ordinance, but... 
you know, yeah, a huge lot might qualify for. And yeah, we can mitigate all the impacts, right, that yeah. people are concerned with. I mean, one other thing that came up during the um, one of the gateway GPA applications was for a new project and the concern, hey, you know, you're you're asking for X many how X many housing units, but you're really, you know, X times three because you can have, you know, the detached ADU plus an internal mm -hmm. ADU. Um, so that's one negative of this law it kind of is going to cause some areas to be a little more cautious in approving projects. Sure, we're already seeing that where folks are looking at reducing base density to the extent feasible under other housing laws um, right. to uh, take into account that ADUs are much more likely to, right. to take place now. So right. can you uh, clarify what streamlining means? And uh, I'm wondering when the for the streamlined project, um, we have to streamline, but can we also increase our notification requirement so that at least people are aware of what's going on around them? Well, I, I can take a stab at that too. I mean, yeah, as these are ministerial approvals, you know, there's no notification of these at all. Even currently and traditionally, any ministerial project would not have any type of notification. There's no but we can, we can start. We it doesn't prohibit us from adding a new notification requirement for such streamlined ADO project, right? I'll ultimately, I'll defer to, to the uh, city attorney's office for an to the final answer on this. But my my impression is that once you start a notification project uh, process, you are inviting discretion, and that's something that the state mm -hmm. does not want to have happen. Is a complete take all discretion out of the city's hands. That doesn't invite uh, discretion. That only invites awareness. And it's still an administrative process. It's, it's still, the, the, the approval process will be exactly the same. But people around uh, any project would just be more aware. And then, so what's, if nothing is prohibiting us from doing that, why not? And uh, another thing, I think the streamlining um, is um, 60 days, right? Yeah. That's from the date the application is complete mm -hmm. or just the date it's submitted. Because as I understand, uh, a lot of applications, they are not complete in the beginning. And so how is this counted? Yeah, yeah you are correct. It's. Um is the, the date that it's considered complete. So if someone just submits a site plan without elevations, that's not a complete application. So you have to have the mechanical drawings, the elevations, anything's required for a complete application, for example. That's, yeah. So it's important now in this streamlined project that we have very specific objective standards on what's considered complete. So we have that, or we, do we need to further re-exam that. Yeah, the, the building department does have, as part of their application for permits, they do have a checklist that, that, that an applicant can fill out. And so is that in the municipal code that we clearly specify streamlining 60 days clock starts from when the application is complete? Do we have that? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna pull it up right now. Clearly specified. So the, the uh, municipal code language is in chapter 19.112.050 under the review process. And what we've done here is just referred back out to the government code section. So government code section 65852.2, um, which is the state law on accessory dwelling units. Um, because this law is so prescriptive as to what it requires of local jurisdictions in a number of places, we've simply referred to state law because it um, has frequently changed and it's it's complex and it's 
easier to just refer out. Um, that state law, though, says that it's within uh, c submission of an application, so a complete application, 60 so days wait. from submission, yeah. S uh, wait, this is different from what you told me earlier. 60 days from submission, which could be an incomplete application. No. So how are we? I just want to be sure that the it's staff has time, the no. full 60 days to process they do. a complete application. So within 60 days from the date, the local agency receives a complete application. Okay. Do we have a definition on complete in our municipal code or any It's via the checklist. Record? If the checklist is complete with all the required so diagrams and So we have a checklist for we the have a checklist. Okay. We have a checklist for construction is what we have. For construction, not project proposal. Well, it's the it's the same. If you're okay. gonna build an ADU, if you're gonna do an addition, if you're gonna build a new house, if you're gonna remodel, you have mm -hmm. to submit a complete application. Okay, great. So my for my earlier question about the notification, if there can we do early notification as soon as the project is submitted, a complete application is submitted when notify uh, neighbors within 500 feet. So we would be permitted to notify. I believe that's, that's allowed under state law. Um, but I want to be clear, the approval that the city staff is going to take is a ministerial one. Sp particularly for these streamlined ADUs, you have like five things you comply with. If you comply with those five things, the city staff has to approve it. And but so, it, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, but oh, please, I mean, please some are streamlined, some are not, right? That's why we need notification. Sure, sure but even for non-streamlined ADUs, it is a ministerial approval. If you meet the standards, the city must issue the permit. And so having notification implies that um, neighbors might be able to um, provide comments and change the city's uh, you know, determination based either on um, their opinions about the project or concerns about impacts. And I don't want to, my concern about providing notification is it might create the impression that the city has discretion to make its decision. And it um, would add a lot of expense to the city yes. for, no, for no reason. Uh, wait, so for, for a ministerial approval project that's approved administratively, if anyone disagree with the approval, because a lot of these are sometimes not black and white, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's an administrative trail, because laws a lot of times are gray. What uh, courses of action neighbors have to appeal an administrative ap approval? I mean, would they have to sue? Or? The only way is to sue the city. Yeah, I, I believe that it could be appealed to the city council, but the city or, or planning commission, depending. But both the planning commission and city council are still bound by state law, and so um, there's very limited ability to change the decision. It's just a question of does it comply or not. Um, so even through that appeals process, ultimately it, it's likely to end up in a court challenge. So they can still appeal. And to to the planning commission and city council, the appeal process is a, is the same as the regular um, yeah. approval. Is that true? We'd have to look at the code section, but I I believe that's the case. Okay, can mm -hmm. you clarify that? Sure. And so that means, actually, for these gray areas, it's important people are notified because when it's gray neighbors might present uh, different uh, facts that could help with the approval process, right? It doesn't mean we are changing anything. It means more facts could be revealed by parties of different interests and better decision could be made on this administrative approval. I think uh, that's what we want. Councilmember Chow, can you uh, clarify what the gray areas you're referring to, just so we have a frame of reference? Uh, for Almost every reason. law, every municipal code, even if it were written, it's, it's language that 
sometimes it's not gray and white. That's why we have court proceeding, we have appeal, we have this and that, right? There are, our municipal code is written in English. Not everyone interprets it the same way. And a lot of times, as we have seen, if we, we, if we reveal project proposal, but only per the person who, are, who wants the project to be approved, approved is present, likely the facts would be biased toward that party. But if we have wider notification, likely other parties will present facts that they think is relevant that we would otherwise not even know. So wider notification does not mean we are doing anything discretionary approval, simply means we will have more facts available when we make decision. Why are we not, why don't we want that? This would avoid uh, appeals of future lawsuits because more facts will be available to us. I believe we can do some notifications without violating anything, so. Yeah. Or we can yeah. even notify to the extent that um, on the notification it says ministerially approved yes. or something like that. Yeah, so. I think this okay. actually reduces our legal risk. Well, I don't know about that, but I would urge the council to move on in discussion because we're running pretty long. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anyone else have anything on this? John? <clears throat> so, um, back to the uh, floor ratio, 45%, and you indicated that in addition to that, they would get their 800 square foot ADU regardless. And then I hear, well, what if we go and enlarge so the thousand square foot for one bedroom would also, well that's kind of what I'm asking, what is that limit? So you've got an R1 area, you've got a house, he wants an ADU, is it 800, is it 1,000, is it 1,200? The, the state's pretty clear that the 800 is the limit in terms of not counting it towards FAR lot coverage. Now it's up to council, council, I mean from what I've Ryan, though, can allow a 1,200 square foot ADU to not count towards FER lot coverage. That's so. That's, I think that's, that's very to, important for all of yeah. us up here to realize. Yeah. When we're talking yeah. 1,200, we're not talking about necessarily extra large lots. We've got the R1 person yeah. who says, "I'm going to take advantage of that 1,200 and yeah. put it in my backyard." Yeah. And maybe there's two adults. Maybe there's three adults. Mm -hmm. Cars with no parking. Mm -hmm that are going to be impacting the res the uh, neighbors yeah. Yeah. and things of that. And so I do like uh, at least initially following the guidance of the uh, planning commission that said, uh, or was it city staff that said, go with the most restrictive mm -hmm. because of the impacts that are going to, you know, the in unintended consequences, sure. but they're consequences nonetheless yes. when you start having these multiple vehicles um, all, you know, filling up the street. Uh, next one, if we didn't adopt these changes, <clears throat> I'm thinking that it still doesn't prevent um, the homeowners that want to do this because there's now the state laws. So if we didn't do this, they would bring their drawings in to the planning, com uh, planning department anyway and they'd say, here's my project, find any issues or, you know, give me permits. And at that time, then, the planning department would have to start rustling through state documents instead of our city ones that could be maybe clearer and easier to understand. So. So I want to just kind of understand that if we did do nothing, it doesn't change. But if we do uh, quantify, qualify what the ADU requirements are in Cupertino, well, they're in line with the state, but at least everybody kind of understands. So as much as I, I uh, am concerned, 
you have families, young children, um, and then you have uh, accessory dwelling units where they have no, no idea of who's coming and going and things of that nature all of a sudden popping up next door. That's why we have R1 versus R2 areas so that people can can fit where they feel they belong. And so I can see why we would need to do this. I hope we all understand the, the ramifications and we don't exacerbate the, the issue for some perceived uh, uh, incentive. Okay, anybody else before sorry, we do the first sorry, reading? Sorry, one more clarification. I think I asked about what separate ATU means in terms of separation. You mentioned er, their example was, are they allowed to have connected the roof? And I think the very early on you said it might be allowed. But from reading the code, it seems it's not allowed, so I want to clarify that. It says no interior doors or other connections between the ADU and the principal dwelling units are permitted. That means connected roofs are not allowed. Yeah, they're, so they're, they're, yeah I mean, the, the intent of that portion that says no interconnectivity is inside of the house. A connected roof is... I mean, if you're attaching an ADU, it, it's, you probably want to have it look structurally similar to the principal dwelling unit. It, it has to have a, I mean, we actually have that, that row in the ordinance where it says that if you're an attached ADU, it, it shall, mm. shall be architecturally compatible with right. the principal dwelling unit. So yes, yeah, so you Oh, have, so this is under the attached. Yeah. So here, the no, uh, no interior doors or other connections you don't mean the roof it's un yeah. it's unclear from right. here it's it's, it's, clear. it's doors it's it's hallways it's stuff that could easily be okay. misconstrued as a as a large so unit. what what my concern was actually about detached adus mm -hmm. so detached adu on, under the yeah. role for separation from principal un dwelling units the only thing it says there is detached from principal dwelling units. What, there is no definition on what detached means. Detached means no sharing the wall, no sharing roof. Yeah. Is that clear? So, so 19100 is our detached, I'm sorry, it's our um, accessory structure ordinance, uh, which, which states that detached structures whether a shed or ADU, have to be five feet separated from the principal dwelling unit, minimally five feet from the eaves. Right. So, yeah, they could not share. So no, it, five feet separate, right. including the roof. Right. Every every eve. structure yes. have yeah. to be separate. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is about non-conforming um, un structure that's currently existing. And can some the city has issued a code violation? They have paid fine. Would they be allowed to recoup the fine from the city now that they are? <laughs> I don't, don't want to answer that question. <laughs> I know. Um, no, no, no. I think it's. I think the. Okay, yeah, you can. You know, you know, we could be here later. all night coming up with okay. these odd scenarios. I I would recommend that you. Okay. Uh, move to action. Yeah, yeah. Can we just okay. um. Um, let's see. So. If there's no more love for right. the idea of uh, some something larger, I will move the staff recommendation. And I will second. Can we conduct the first reading. Oh, but I would like to have the early notification on the staff could come back with a recommendation on how to do early notification. Huh? No, it doesn't need to be in the code. We'll just do it. It doesn't need to be in the code. We'll just do it. Yeah, I would um, oppose putting it in the code. Yes. You could include it in your resolution to make it clear, but it doesn't, we don't need to include it in the codified ordinance. Okay. I would also, um, we had language, can you go back to that slide? Uh, yes, sorry. Okay. 
um, we had included this additional language to make sure that basement square footage was counting. And so I'd, we'd ask the staff recommendation is to um, adopt as proposed in the staff report with this additional language that oh, you can see on the okay. screen. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. I wonder if we could do the first reading. Cool. Okay. okay. Can we clarify if there was a friendly amendment to your motion regarding notice, Council Member Sinks? Uh, that's not part of my motion. I mean, one concern I have is mm. if these are these uh, projects are predominantly ministerial um, we may be stirring up controversy by uh, and time and expense I think if our interest is in building more housing we ought to comply with the state law uh, approve these things ministerially and get on with it everything we do that delays blocks hinders uh, makes us look like we aren't really very interested in producing housing and I, for one, am interested in producing housing through ADUs. But it shouldn't come at the cost of transparency and democracy. So, transparency, adding transparency. Yeah, you can defeat my motion there if you like, but, but I, I will, I will, I will read the staff report. Okay. As, uh, Mayor Scharf, if me. Yeah, sure, go. Uh, I will support Council Member Sink's motion, and uh, I would like to uh, encourage the majority of the council to uh, support the city manager's articulation of uh, what the city will in effect practice as to a, a noticing of the neighbors. So if there's a third, um, I'll, I'll support Council Member Chow's uh, request as well as the city manager's articulation of what the staff will, will perform. Um, so, if there's a third, then... So I'm worried that when we start with notification, is that going to cut into the 60 days? No. It simply well, means... Yeah, can, no, can no. they answer it, not you? Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, I would like the staff to answer what exactly you have in mind about notification. Good luck. Yeah, well, well I think... It, go ahead, City Manager. So I'd like to clarify then, are there more than... Are there a majority that want to, us to notify early? Let me answer it with a question. So right now, if somebody goes and puts a two-story house on a one-story lot, the neighbors have to be notified, I believe, to three houses on each side. Is that true? Unless that's been removed, that's what it used to be? Yes, um, two-story permits, which right. are discretionary. So just so that we have an idea of what we're talking about noticing, we're not mm -hmm. talking about you know anything beyond that. Noticing, if, you know, at least two houses on each side, front and back, that there's going to be occupants, you know, within that piece of property, letting them know that they're going to be there. They may want to take some measure. They may want to uh, get a new fence put in, uh, you, you name it, as opposed to things start being constructed and it's surprise, surprise. I, I think noticing being a practice is a good thing. and. For a couple houses on each side, I think it's good. Also, the parking, gee whiz, well, what are we going to do? Well, I've got an extra car. Maybe I should get rid of it. I mean, it can't hurt. I think we need to be a resident-focused community here. So, so yeah, that, that's fine. If it's noticing within, you know, three houses, fine. I will support that. So for clarity, I need from council what you'd like to do with notification because I'm getting uh, advice from the city attorney that we should not do it. I just think we should stick to our parliamentary procedure that we have a motion. Um, I think what the city manager is saying is that um, she's not hearing consensus on this. She'd like to get direction from council about the noticing. So we have a motion to move the staff recommendation as with the amendment shown in the staff report uh, without any further direction regarding no noticing. Um, there's a second. If someone would like to make another motion, that's the next procedure. So why, can, why are you advising against doing noticing as part of this? I, I think um, our attorney, Sarah Clark, said that she's concerned it would apply the city has discretion where it does not, but it is within the council. She's also clarified right. it's within okay. the council's authority under state law to require the noticing if they'd like it. And so Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. if it's noticing that says this is happening and you can't do anything about it, um, which is essentially what we would have to say, you know, 
We're letting yeah. you know because maybe there's going to, you'll have future parking issues on your street. You might want to, you know, do something about that. Um, yeah. But as long as you make it clear that it's a ministerial approval, um, you really can't object to it. I mean, as I mean, a practical matter, my guess is this also takes time away from staff's evaluation. If you want mm. staff to have more time to do a thorough evaluation, um, I, I'm, I would be concerned. You, you already are on a very uh, trim path. And if now all of a sudden, right, you have residents, neighbors that say, hell no, I don't want this, mm -hmm. what's staff going to be spending their time on? actually looking at things that might say no this is not or listening to to a conversation that really probably doesn't lead to you know the staff being able to focus on its work to do that make that ministerial determination yes or no this complies or it doesn't so i, I think you know we're we're treading in territory here that uh is not helpful to the to the processing uh, meticulous processing of, of an application which of course takes uh, professionals that we have not so very many of right we heard earlier I believe that we do not have a robust um, uh, planning department we we are uh, short on planners at the moment so you you can have all kinds of noticing and other transparency measures but I'm wondering right where uh, whether this is really productive and furthers the interests of the residents in the city that also want to produce some housing on their own land. So you are suggesting we do this behind closed doors? What? This is a public project. <laughs> we are proving, even though the state requires it's a question streamlining, of, it's a question we are not lowering any project. standard on streamlining. We still have to approve okay, the it's project a question of how within you choose 60, to, feet, choose 60 to days. Use staff resources. I think the public has the right to know if a structure is going to their backyard and more cars are going to be on their street. They should not find out after the fact. That's when you will bring more controversial after the fact. So from what I heard from the city manager, yeah. it sounds like you would agree to do noticing, but not part of this resolution. Is that true? To the extent. It would be informal noticing. Yes. Okay. We can do a small radius, <clears throat> even though it's not uh, advisable, and maybe the notification is specific to uh, basically here's what's happening, and you can't right. stop. Right, yeah. Here's thing. what's happening in Tough Luck, mm -hmm. um, but maybe you we'll want to We'll find a nice way to say it. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that you, you can say that. You do, have, if you, you do have to say, here's what's happening, and uh, here are the process that going, it's going to be processed. And if you object, here are the venues of oh, expressing. No, I, would, I wouldn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Again, the notification would then imply discretion, right? Yeah. I can't wait no, for no a council meeting in the future that I won't be part of, frankly. I'm still waiting. Uh, where you're going to have people in here protesting every project that receives ministerial determination. No, if, if that's they... The, if that's the kind of small ball game that you want to play at the city council, Act be my guest. Actually, if they were notified ahead of time, all the issues will be resolved before the project got approved. So they won't get repealed. They won't come to the council because the both sides would have presented their fact and the staff would have taken into, the cons into account of the concerns of the neighbors and uh, facts they present during the approval process. Okay, so I, I think, think that's better. Can, can, can we just um, conduct the first reading with the revisions and whoever doesn't like it can vote no. So can I then add a friendly amendment that the with direction to staff to do on um, no notification well, at the time the, the project that, is approved anyway. is submitted to notify maybe like three houses around that the side I think only the side and the back of a, of and, a house 
and let me just ask, because this may help, for the two-story houses, the three uh, uh, properties that have to be notified, is that in the code or is that in simply the practice and in the uh, handout that you get somebody who comes in? <coughs> so for, uh, yeah, it's, it's in the ordinance for stuff like minor residential permits, uh, two-story permits. We do have radius, radius noticing requirements within the ordinance. Okay, so that would go beyond. So as long as city staff says that they would. But those are not ministerial yeah. approvals. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, uh, good clarification. Um, you know, for single-story homes, you can build it without any notification. It's a ministerial process, as long as you meet all the setbacks and standards. Um, for applications like a minor residential permit, um, where you're extending, for example, you're extending a non-conforming wall line, you're adding a second story, two-story permit, um, those, variance. yeah, or variance. I mean, those things have established noticing uh, procedures because they are, I, I guess, uh, well, how would you call it, quasi-judicial? Yeah, an adjudicatory decision. Yeah, so well, there are some discretion the city has. So. Where the city where the city has discretion. Right. And so the, your current noticing table only requires noticing for discretionary decisions that are being made by the city. And so this, uh, the amendment that has been floated uh, would be extending noticing requirements to types of decisions that you are not currently noticing for. So for single story homes, do we notice at all? If, if, they, made, if they meet every prescriptive objective standard, no. no. So no. If they meet, yeah. Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to call the call the um, great motion to a vote. Thanks. Okay, so um, so, so this we? is calling. Um, just to be clear, we did not receive a, a second on the amendment. Correct. And so it's calling the original motion. So um, so we are not voting on the amendment. No. There was no second. Okay. Okay. You ready? Did she conduct? Oh, you yeah, you need to conduct the first reading. This is, this is the first reading of ordinance number 20-2199 in ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cupertino amending 19.112 accessory dwelling units chapter 19.20 permitted conditional and excluded uses in agricultural and residential zones in chapter 19.08 definitions. So to make this formal, I move that we find the proposed actions are exempt from CEQA and that we have conducted the first reading of ordinance number 20-2199, an ordinance of the City Council of Cupertino amending chapter 19.1.22, accessory dwelling units, chapter 19.20, permitted conditional and excluded uses in agricultural residential zones, and chapter 19.08, definitions, with the uh, basement uh, provision that uh, staff has added as a. Right, okay, second. And vote. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, we've been going for more than three hours, so let's take a uh, five minute break. <laughs> 